Uh, well, seeing a presence of the quorum, I would call meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.01 p.m. Welcome, everyone. And uh, seeing the presence of the quorum, I'll also call this meeting of the Regional School District Planning Board to order at the same time. Okay, great. And uh, Ms. Joyce, perhaps so that we don't have dueling chairs, you can, you can take the, uh, the gavel of, you know, who speaks next and all that. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can share. How's that? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, as you may have sussed out by now, we have a joint meeting today of the Amherst School Committee and the Regional School District Planning Board. Um, so, welcome to members of the Planning Board for coming tonight. Thank you so much for trekking over here to Amherst. <laughs> Um, so we want to move actually quickly because I understand a couple of members have to go to another meeting, is that right, uh, in Pelham. So um, I just wanted to, uh, if we can, take a, a moment to look over the minutes of August 14th. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, I can move the approval of the minutes of the Amherst School Committee on August 14th, 2018. Thank you. Do you have a second? I second. Thank you. Uh, any comments, edits, changes? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor to approve the minutes of August 14th? Signify by raising your hand. Thank you. It's unanimous. Okay, uh, moving along to our, the next item on our agenda is announcements and public comment. I just want to make a, a comment both for uh, members of the, the audience that are here as well as those watching. We actually have two public comments set up for tonight. Um, so this is our general public comments uh, time, what we normally set up. Um, so that anyone can speak on any issue. Um, each member of the audience has three minutes to speak, um, but we will also come back and open up on a, spe on a special issue later on in the agenda, um, and that's related to uh, infrastructure uh, concerns and, and questions that have come up recently. So uh, before we move into public comment, though, are there any announcements from the committee? Oh, it's a quiet group today. <laughs> okay, well, I have two very quick announcements. One, um, so Amherst Media is having their, uh, they have a fundraising gala this Saturday, September 29th. Um, members of the community, uh, but also the superintendent and the committee are welcome to attend. Uh, for members of the committee, um, tickets are free. Um, so you are welcome to a f one free ticket to attend. Um, it should be a great evening. I think Amherst Media is obviously very well appreciated and recognized for the work that they do here in the community. Um, so it'll be a moment to kind of reflect on that and thank them for their service. Um, the other announcement that I have is the Amherst Education uh, Foundation is actually holding their spelling bee uh, coming up very soon. It's the 25th. Fifth, I believe. Mm -hmm. trivia bee, I the trivia bee. I'm sorry. Yeah. You, you might be confusing it. The 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm I'm thinking of the trivia bee. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So that's coming up soon, and typically uh, the Amherst School Committee also will um, take up a, uh, will form a team. So if any members of the committee are interested in forming a team for the Trivia Bee, please let me know. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a great event uh, for a good cause. So just wanted to let you know about that. Okay, so uh, if there are no other announcements, uh, we will open up for public comment. A reminder that members uh, of the audience, anyone can speak on an issue, just come up to the mic, uh, announce your name, um, and you have three minutes uh, to speak. Okay, seeing no comments. <laughs> Um, let's see, we're a little bit early, um, but since we have a second public comment uh, period built into the agenda, I guess we'll wait for a little while um, later on for, for people to come back if they need to. Okay, so um, moving on to the uh, Regional School District Planning Board discussion. Uh, Mr. Demling, do you want to introduce the topic and perhaps walk us through the discussion? Sure. So, uh, like you said, tonight uh, we are a joint meeting of uh, Amherst School Committee and the Amherst and Pelham Regional School District Planning Board. So 
I'll explain what that means in a second, but essentially we're a six-person town board of Amherst and Pelham, uh, exploring, regionalizing, possibly our three K to six uh, districts. Um, and so tonight we have uh, Tom Banning, Emily Marriott, Kara Kastensen, myself, um, our other two members uh, weren't able to be here tonight, uh, Joan Temkin and Marilyn Talman, uh, send their regards. And uh, so I put together some slides, um, set them out a little, a little bit earlier, but I'll go through them fairly quickly um, so that we can leave most of the time for questions. Um, we've had many, been meeting a lot lately, and so we have a lot of, um, uh, of in-depth discussions that won't all fit in these slides, so whatever you're interested in, we can follow that. So I thought I would run through these slides, and then we can go from there. Sounds great. All right. So, um, the School District Planning Board. So, the origin, um, so how we formed, so uh, essentially the Pelham School Committee requested um, that the Pelham Town Meeting approve formation of a regional school district planning committee. Um, and so that was Ms. Castinson, Mr. Fanning, and Ms. Marriott. Um, and that same thing happened at the Amherst level uh, last fall. Um, and so those members are myself, Mary Lou Tomlin, and John Temkin, uh, one required school committee member on each of those committees. Um, and then last winter, those committees meet separately, and the way that the process works, uh, those committees can choose to form a board with one or more planning committees. In this case, Amherst and Palm came together, so now we're a six-person um, board exploring uh, regionalization. So, so what, what's the purpose? So this is straight from the Mass General Law. Um, it's the duty to study the fiscal and educational advisability of establishing a regional school district um, and also estimating construction and operating costs, uh, assessing educational soundness, um, and submitting a report of findings and recommendations to, to the public. Um, and so, so that's the, that's the technical charge. In terms of a, a, a process of what we're looking at, um, we're currently, so here's, here's kind of a timeline, so our process and potential timeline. Um, like a, I'll just uh, say what I mean by potential in a moment. Um, but right now we're actively studying all the financial and educational issues um, that would impact um, uh, holding two districts into one as a regional district, gathering public feedback, uh, feedback and input. Um, around springtime is our, our target date to make a general recommendation, a sort of milestone point of checkpoint of uh, do we want to further pursue? And if, if we do make that recommendation, um, there would be a period of intense collaborative work with the uh, Amherst School Committee and the Palm School Committee uh, to come up with a detailed regional working agreement, uh, the document that um, defines the rules of uh, how the school committee is composed, how the assessment method is funded and whatnot. Uh, and then towards the fall, uh, there would be a Palm Town meeting vote uh, in Amherst. Uh, it would be a, a town-wide vote, since we have, we will at this point have a town council in place. Uh, and if that vote is yes, um, by the end of 2019, there's then a six-month transition period, and the new district would take into effect July 1st of the following year. So in terms of how we map out the, the time, the, the sort of um, requirement that we track back from is that a regional agreement has to be approved and completely done uh, in the calendar year before the new region begins. So um, the vote has to happen by the end of 2019, it's going to take into effect 2020. So. Um, so the reason why we're sort of targeting a spring 2019 date is to give us enough time to thoughtfully work on the regional agreement. With the school committees, it also has to be uh, submitted to the Department of Education for their approval. Uh, it it's continues to be a, a time of public input and feedback as you're, as you're getting all the details down. Um, so you need enough time to do that. Um, so so we're, we're trying to hit that date, um, but we've said multiple times at our meetings that we've well, we want to be expeditious, we want to be as deliberative as necessary as possible. So it may come to next February and March, and the board might feel like we don't have enough information even to make a general recommendation moving forward, or not. So we're sort of leaving that open, but this is the sort of general timeline um, that we're marching towards. Um, in terms of how we relate to school committees, so, so we're a joint town board, and the, the primary purpose is to study, make a recommendation, uh, and to gather public input and, and feedback and inform the public. Um, so, so in that process, uh, the school committees are a key constituent um, in informing uh, what the concerns are, what questions need to be answered, and then writing up the regional agreement. Um, and also raising public awareness. You know, we're, we're only a, a six-person volunteer board, you know, so we need help getting the word out and public forums and, and whatnot. Um, 
in terms of other people that we're working with and that are resources for the board. So the superintendent, the central office, um, for answering questions about um, different financial or educational issues, um, supporting our open meetings. Um, Debbie Westmore has been fantastic. Um, uh, Mr. Morgano has been very helpful with the, the, the consultant contract process. Um, so then, uh, funded through a, a regionalization and efficiency grant that we secured, secured last year of 21500 we have a financial consultant, Mark Abrams, um, who has multiple past engagements with uh, our school district, uh, and extensive experience looking at the financial analysis of uh, regionalization studies. So he's, he's looking at the, the nuts and bolts of that. Uh, and then uh, we're terming our process consultant uh, to help us dig through issues of governance and education and school committee composition. Uh, things of that nature on ISMARS, the Mass Association of Regional School Committees. Um, in fact, I think one of our consultants is in the audience tonight, uh, Jay Barry. Um, so um, they have extensive experience consulting on, on these issues as well. And we just have to have a meeting with them this morning. Um, and then public forums. So we're still working out exactly how we want to do this, but um, given that public input is, is a huge priority for the board, um, the idea has been to hold a number of public forums, maybe two or more in the fall, and then two or more in the early winter, um, where we really um, are able to dive deep and, and engage, engage the public with, with their concerns. Because regionalization can be kind of a wonky issue, uh, so to be able to describe that and get that back. So we may enlist a consultant to help us uh, plan and, and run those meetings, but we're still, still working through that. Um, so that's kind of a lot of stretch. In terms of you know, what is regionalization, um, the sort of three of the key points that we're trying to emphasize whenever we have any opportunity to engage with the public, like this meeting or others. Uh, one is that we're exploring a new pre-K to six region uh, with Pelham and Amherst only. So there was another effort a couple of years ago to look at a, a region with uh, leverage and shoot spread. So that, that's not in scope. So this is just uh, Amherst and Pelham. And in terms of what a regional school district is, it's, it's a, would share school services, buildings, and have one budget with one school committee. And so the, the Amherst School Committee and the Pone School Committee uh, sunset. And so, so what does that mean? So it, it, it triggers the exploration of questions um, like the election and composition of a shared school committee, how do those members get selected, what are the roles, who gets to vote for what, um, how you determine the assessment method, which is obviously can be a challenging piece as we've seen in the region, um, how you might work in some rules for future building use. Um, it's a lot of uh, righteous and appropriate love for Pelham Elementary in the town of Pelham, and so that's that's concern on on their end. Um, so that's that's an example of some of the questions. Um, and, and another sort of big point is uh, a little bit of confusion over you know aren't we already sort of joined? Um, so Pelham, Pelham and Amherst, we already do share a superintendent, uh, curriculum, and central office staff through Union Twenty Six. Um, but, uh, however, we don't receive the additional state funding that regional school districts districts receive. So. The big financial carrot incentive for regionalizing is regional transportation reimbursement. So depending on what level uh, the state chooses to fund it that year, um, for Amherst that could be anywhere from 250 to 300,000 ish ballpark. So it's it's not, that's uh, it's one of the main incentives. Uh, there's other financial um, incentives to consider, but that's that's the main one that, that you don't get just because we have a, a superintendency union. Um, so I won't go through all these points too small, um, but I just sort of uh, wanted to give you a, a taste of some of the, the very detailed questions that we're actively talking about right now. I've already mentioned a few of these. Um, there's some other questions about um, what would the impact to the existing 7 to 12 region be? Um, would What, if anything, would we have to change about enrollment zone policies? This is not an issue in Pelham, because there's one school. Uh, but Amherst obviously is, and so there's questions about if you're from Pelham, would you have access to, say, your language program? Or uh, if you're in Amherst and you're physically closest to Pelham Elementary, would you be able to enroll in that school? And so um, one thing that Mars has been very helpful with us so far is helping us to scope these questions in terms of what does a regional planning board need to define uh, prior to making a recommendation and what should be left to a future regional school committee? Um, and, um, and, what, and what, if anything, needs to be written into a regional uh, agreement? So this is our FYI information. So we have rsdtv at ops.org is our email. Um, that's the shortest URL I can come up with for, <laughs> for our webpage at, at ops.org. Um, uh, and uh, so that has our agenda packets, minutes, documents, we're working on the, the FAQ. 
Um, we had forwarded uh, in the packet, I think, uh, our one-page one flyer of, of general info that we're trying to get out. Um, we're meeting every, every couple weeks in the morning. I'm hoping to get the public forums going. So. That is the quickest intro I can give of the uh, <laughs> process so far. So. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm uh, curious about, you know, this is obviously a really helpful update, um, and I would love to hear from the other board members, um, if you're so inclined, to tell us maybe a little bit about the process. But I'm also curious about, it, you know, if there's any specific issues or questions that you're hoping that we can help resolve tonight in this joint meeting, um, that would be great to hear as well. So uh, I mean, I'll just say uh, one thing we're trying to work through is what the best way to engage the public is, and so public forums is one avenue we've, we've contemplated exploring. Um, we don't know exactly what the most effective use of time. Um, what, uh, how should I say? We're trying to be, uh, have people's time used most effectively in this very busy fall time for Amherst, right? So uh, we know that on the Amherst School Committee, there's a lot of things that we're trying to get public feedback on, do language, uh, etc. So maybe there's some opportunity for for uh, a joint forum or not. I'm just sort of thinking off the top of my head, um, but certainly help helping in terms of getting the word out in communication is just one general topic. Me. Questions or comments, Ms. Bitzer? Well, just to follow up on um, Peter's point, I was wondering if maybe there would be a way. So, given how packed everybody's schedule is, were, were you envisioning maybe creating? maybe even a, like a survey or a way that people could, I mean, I'm sure people would feel empowered to just email you directly, but maybe more actively like seeking feedback either electronically or, you know, rather than just in person. Yeah, so a survey is something we had not considered, but it's a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> just because it's, I'm sure people who have opinions on this weren't necessarily going to be able to attend the forum. Right. Mr. Nakajima? So do you have a sense of what the schedule is for deliverables and some of the answers? I mean, I read through the materials you shared earlier, and there's um, a lot of really great questions. <laughs> and I don't really have any opinion. I mean, it looks like you've captured all. I mean, probably haven't covered all of them, literally. I'm sure people in the audience are going to think of others. But it seems like an exhaustive list of questions. And so one of the things the question for me is, uh, how are you going to be, or when are you going to be gathering some of the, if not answers, at least the data or whatever, the, whatever decision point information you're going to be gathering, and um, what what's the point of intersection with being able to share with some of those? I mean, I know you want to be able to, the, your group needs to be able to absorb what you learn and think about it, and so presumably there's then a delay after that you had a chance to sift through it before you'd be sharing it with us. So I'm just wondering, is that November? Is that December? Is it? Mr. Demling? Yeah. So. Um, so the financial, uh, the real nuts and bolts uh, analysis that um, Mr. Abrams is doing, we're hoping that, that that's completed in you know, October, November-ish time frame. So, so fairly soon in the process. Um, in terms of the, the sort of priority questions, so, so since this packet was produced, we, yeah. we, we did, went through a prioritization exercise of <laughs> what do we want to answer first and what do we want to dive down into. Mm -hmm. um, we sent that to Mars, and actually this morning we went through our first high-level overview of, of going through each of the questions. We got a lot of Things, things answered and sort of uh, two or three major issues bubbled at the surface of, oh, we want to have a full meeting on sure, this issue and sure. a full meeting on that. Um, so uh, in terms of getting the information back to this committee and back to the public, mm -hmm. um, so I've set a fairly lofty goal for us of wanting to get an A-plus in terms of transparency. <laughs> so um, one thing we're trying to do is to publish any document um, that, we, that we talk about at our meeting almost immediately, so within 24 to 48 hours. Um, so that will include you know, the initial uh, answers that Mars has produced. Um, and uh, if you go back and, and you start to look at the different meetings, you'll see some, sort of the draft evolution, where we, we thought we, this was the focus, and then it came into further clarity, then we prioritized, and we had some answers. Um, and, and as we get sort of firm answers, I think the idea is that we'll, we'll start putting that as an FAQ on, on the web page. Um, so, so that's one way to do it. We're also trying to get our minutes. Um, and we have some great minute takers, which is great, um, onto the, uh, the web page within a couple of days as well. Um, so as, as those answers come in, try and codify that in the FAQ on the web page as best we can. Ms. Kastensen? Um, I think one thing we're trying, it's kind of an organic process, I think. I mean, because we really want to be able to 
engage the public soon um, so that we can get feedback from the public about, you know, that will inform our work with the consultants. And so it is kind of a balance to figure out, like, at what point can we go to the public if we don't have definite answers to some of these questions, but not wanting to wait too late. So right. I think we're trying to strike that balance, and we'll just have to kind of develop a little bit more. So we have to um, uh, come up as a board. We have to agree on whether or not it's advisable to go forward. So we have to inform ourselves of all the rules of the game. And we started this morning with our consultants from Mars who kind of just dumped a whole bunch of information on us about uh, the rules of the process of creating a region. And all of that is something we have to work through uh, and then get to the point where we think we understand it, we think we have a process, and at the same time, we're sharing this information with the public and getting feedback from the public, from you folks, about uh, how you feel about certain things or questions that you might have. Uh, and then it, at some point, we have to reach a, an agreement about whether to go forward and create a, an official agreement or not. And, and that process is, as Peter described, is going to be running out over the next year, uh, six months to a year. We look, we look forward to having a lot of fun conversations like the one we had today with the folks from Mars. <laughs> So I have a question. I, I'm wondering if any of you have heard, um, are you getting a sense at all from, from the community that there, from communities, that there's any sense of awareness at all of what what's actually being considered? You know, I mean, we've had a, we had that column that was out recently. There's been a lot of conversation, at least on this committee, um, about the, you know, the exploration of this potential re regionalization. Are you getting any sense at all from people that they're listening to that, they're hearing that, or is it just still so far under the radar that they're <laughs> not awake to it yet. It, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, and I, I think I suffer from kind of an echo chamber effect that when I ask the people, <laughs> you know, who I talk to about town, they're aware of it, but I think most of the people I talk to uh, follow town events pretty closely, so it's a, it's a selection bias going on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, we've, um, we had an extra meeting on uh, next week um, so trying to pick the date, about um, just trying to schedule out uh, all the individual, individual groups that we want to uh, meet with and reach out to. So we have like a one-page kind of, this is what regionalization is, top five FAQ, here's how you contact us, we can electronically send out. Uh, but we're also going to, you know, reach out to the PGOs and say, hey, we'd like to get on your agenda. I reach out to CPAC and say, hey, we'd like to get on your agenda. Um, so there's like a subset of groups within the school community. Uh, we, all, but we're all, we also want to be sensitive that this is a, this is a town wide <coughs> issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, we want to reach out to the senior center, to other groups that aren't maybe necessarily directly connected to, um, to school issues that we might normally think of would, it, would affect parents and, and students. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, th I think, um, I, I think for, for, for people that don't follow town uh, goings on that closely, there's probably not a high level of awareness, but you know, we'd like to change that. <laughs> Dr. Morris, is there anything you'd like to add on this? No, I think, um, well, I can't say no and then then. Um, but, um, you know, Mr. the Chair and I have spoken about opportunities that we can, you know, access the superintendent newsletter. And I know later on the Amherst School Committee, and I'm conscious it's not in this topic, um, there's a topic of school committee forum planning. And mm -hmm. I think probably I'll have more to say in that section about um, how to maybe draw in some folks, because um, I think you're right, it's as compared to some other things that this district has had forums on, this is probably one level of abstraction up. Um, not because it's not important or, or critically important, but in terms of how would this affect my child to the large, to a parent guardian, I think it's a longer explanation than some of the other things we've had forums on in the past. Um, so trying to think about the, the way to gather that information and messaging um, effectively is something that I'm happy to help with, but I think I'd prefer to talk about it in, in a broader context of how we're reaching out this fall to families, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. 
I also have just one more uh, question, I guess. I mean, I, you know, I think it, it strikes me, and we've had, we've sort of touched on this before, um, we're in a unique position here in Amherst because the Amherst School Committee is elected, obviously, by the community, and it also serves a dual purpose as the Amherst School Committee, and then it feeds into the Regional School Committee. Um, and if we were to sunset, as Mr. Demling mentioned before, the Amherst School Committee, um, we don't really have any rule book at this point for how members of the Regional Committee are selected from Amherst and what that means. And so. I'm just curious if you guys have talked about that, if that's something that the consultant is looking into. There's a lot of uh, legal you know, pieces to this that we don't even understand yet. Mr. Demling? So yes, we, uh, we actually talked about it extensively this morning. OK. <laughs> yeah, so this is one of the, you know, uh, I'd say top six questions um, mm -hmm. that we're exploring. You know, does it, to what extent, if any, does this have an impact to the 7 to 12 region? And that's, that's one of the subtopic questions. Mm -hmm. Well, how does the appointment work? And if we if we change the appointment, does the seven to twelve uh, region need to be opened, and to what extent does it need to be opened? And if it does, you know, what is, can the scope be limited? Um, uh, it's it's actually a good example of of one um, theme that comes up again and again with our board, which is we want to be very conscious uh, that we have a, a specific but but very scoped mission on the board. Uh, it's it's not our job to solve. Uh, different problems at the 712 region. It's not our job to um, offer solutions to enrollment zone issues uh, in Amherst. It's not our job to opine on um, building construction and future buildings. Um, you know, there's, there's intersections, obviously, um, but we want to be conscious that you know we're a, a sort of a, providing the um, the research and information to the public first and foremost. Um, but that is that is one. And so we actually sent um, a number of legal questions through the Amherst Town Manager to the Amherst Town Council, uh, who sent them back, um, uh, got back to us yesterday, so we, we discussed them this morning, um, and we'll be publishing that document. If it's not already, it'll be on the web page shortly. Um, but yeah, so we're actively looking through those issues, precisely the ones I mentioned. Okay. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, so I, um, I guess since there hasn't been a lot of questions and there hasn't been a lot of comments, um, I thought I'd just interject the point that the reason why I'm not digging in for a lot of questions is that I don't actually think it's useful to do so, absent a set of potential answers in front of us that we can mm -hmm. mill through. But I think this is one of those things where I think it's less than useful to have a conversation that's entirely theoretical, like a theoretical construct of like, what do you think about X or Y? Um, I don't know that I don't know what difference that makes without actually looking at you know, well, what are the legal constraints? How have other districts done this? Um, what are the implications? So like, what are the specific scenarios for representations on the committees, for example? Or um, how have any kind of agreements that would, for example, protect Pelham Elementary from being closed in the near future or ensuring the town of Pelham has a direct say? You know what I mean? Those kind of, those kind of things that I saw on your list. Those are really great questions, but I don't, I'm not even sure it's useful to sit around talking, I mean, it's useful for you guys to do that. But for us in this public forum, I'm not even sure it's useful to have that conversation absent some of the answers you're bringing in and some sort of filter that says, well, let's have a structured conversation where we're trying to engage in this. So I'm, I'm, I'm only expressing this because I actually think it's incredibly useful to do that. It's one of the reasons I was asking earlier when you thought you'd have the information, start getting information back. So I think my personal bias would be sooner rather than later when your group feels like you're comfortable that you have a handle on the quality of the information you've been getting and it's sort of ready for prime timeness, um, I would then find it useful for us to have a next, a next conversation where we then, you list some of these questions or even the chair and the vice chair, that's not a conflict of interest, I guess, <laughs> um, sit and, and try to figure out for the Amherst School Committee, let's go through a set of questions we want to talk through at a given meeting bring that information in and then have at a question where we're really digging in. And ideally, I guess, that we get some of that, like you did here with this PowerPoint, that we get some of that information in advance so that we can read through it, dig through it, and then really have a rich conversation. So I think that would, however, you, however we're handling the public's engagement, I actually think even having a dialogue between the Amherst School Committee, maybe the Amherst and Pelham, and, and, this, and this board, um, that had that level of meat and heft to it and sort of back and forth would be really instructive, be useful, mm -hmm. be interesting. 
Yeah, I think I would just add, like before we get to that, um, looking through the list of kind of the key things we're looking at, um, it's helpful for us to hear from you if there's things that you think should be on there that aren't, mm -hmm. or um, things that you think will be significant concerns to Amherst community that, that we should make sure we're paying really close attention to. So we have had discussions about what we think those things are, but it's also good to hear from other folks. Mm -hmm. you know. So that I think at this point in time, that, that kind of information is really, really helpful to us. Mm -hmm. Just a final comment for me. Um, I think the challenge in the work, and you all know this, is how do you get to the specifics, as Mr. Nakajima was saying, and then also don't get in the weeds and lose the, I'm bad at analogies, you all know that by now, um, but just that there, there's small details that are critically important, and then there's a larger piece of is this a good idea that, some of it's based on the small, and I don't mean small is in, insignificant, but there's also this kind of significant shift that this would result in of having one committee and joining two communities and so how to balance the kind of finer details and the larger piece without you know you can't lose either and I think you know again when we think about community engagement uh, keeping both of those central because you know one could imagine just having high level conversation what it would mean to join two communities in this way and one could imagine having you know very specific detailed conversations and I think we want to make sure that both of those happen because I think the details are important and the meta um, thinking this through about um, the larger issues that are not so temporal because some of the smaller ones you make the decision and then they, they stick and some of them are sort of long lasting um, and not about transition but actually about philosophically changing the governance of, of the district and so I, I'm just saying it out loud that I think keeping both of those things live and active is going to be an important challenge to me. Yes, sir. Um, and also, just in response to this question, if there's something on here that we'd like to see more information about, I noted that you bring up um, you bring up pre K to six in the beginning, but then it kind of falls off in the it's all of the following pages about rationale for doing K to six regionalization study. So I wasn't sure. I'd like to understand better what happened to pre K in the, in the following slides and if there is an impact on slots available or cost or something for pre-K specifically, that would be interesting to me. Mr. Demon. Uh, the reason why it says K-6 on, on those particular slides, because these, these were the slides that Amherst School Committee presented to town meeting um, when the, we were oh. promote, promoting the promotion. And I, I think it was just a, a, an oversight. Okay. I, I think it, we actually talked about it later on. So, you know what, that's really say pre -K. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, so just, you know, but yeah, but it's always been less than the idea of Okay. Yeah, I just, so it's a really good point that Dr. Morris brought up about the, the temporal, the temporalness, <laughs> is that it's, um, I, I, I am very aware, I don't know what the perfect solution is to combating this bias, that it's, it's this proximity bias, right? So for example, uh, buildings are, are on the mind of people in Amherst, infrastructure, as we'll talk about later, right? And so um, there's, there's thoughts that come into your mind when you see a building in Pelham that is in fairly decent shape. Um, but that exists in 2018. Right? And we're talking about a decision that could last for multiple decades, that should last for, and so it's, it's a really long-term solution, so it's very hard, I think, to put all of those short-term things aside and just philosophically, like Dr. Morris was referring to, just say, is, is this good educationally, um, you know, structurally, organizationally for both towns? So it's definitely on our mind, it's something that we want to be aware of. Mr. The, um, I agree with that. I agree with both of the comments. But I mean, I think questions of like, does Pelham have the right to hold on to its elementary school or does it not, is in fact a long range issue, not just a short term issue. And the fiscal implications of ownership, <coughs> debt service, maintenance, and, you know, apportioning costs, which you have on your list, by the way. I mean, it's a good list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for new capital investments, including new schools, those are both, I mean, I mean, so I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm saying some of those things that may seem like they're details are in fact actually essential long-term issues as well as short, as well as immediate issues we're facing. Yeah. And I, I, I hope, I mean, I'm assuming the, the exercise you went through to prioritize basically had sort of buckets of topics you're dealing with. And then you started shifting 
things that are probably are genuinely more details or immediate transition issues from things. But in every in like every topic you can think of is going to have probably long-term implications as well as short-term ones, right? I'm assuming. I think another question uh, is just regarding our superintendency, like what happens to our superintendent, right? I mean, we have, you know, superintendent currently who's juggling multiple districts. Um, and with this regionalization, things could also could get better, but they could also get more complicated. So I think it's worth uh, exploring and thinking about publicly because we really would un want to understand, you know, what, um, I guess, you know, what options exist out there uh, for similar communities that are, that are also undergoing regionalization like this at this level. If, if there's, I don't even know if there's any other examples of multiple districts shared under one superintendency. We've, we've got one of the highest, I think, in the state, right? So I can't I'm looking think, at Dr. Morris yeah, for... I'm looking at my Morris <laughs> friend over there. Um, I'm trying to think of a district that, uh, where superintendent is shared between two regional districts. Because there's other examples, yeah. like Frontier, for instance, where there's a region, like similar models to ours. Can you think of any? Um, Mohawk Trail has a regional district within itself. It does. So that's an example of a superintendent serving two regions. And then, of course, as you know, Mike. Do you want to, I'm sorry, do you want to come up to the, okay feel free to <laughs> come up to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Moore, nobody so can hear you from. Multiple examples of a superintendent serving a region and a superintendent right. union. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then there, I think there are examples, but there are fewer in number relative to a superintendent serving two regions. Yeah. But there's nothing that says you can't do that as long as it's appropriately included in your regional agreements. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank That's you. That's helpful. Thanks. Thank you for raising the topic. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, I have two questions, I guess, for, for the, the board. Um, one is, you know, if we have additional thoughts or questions uh, to Ms. Marriott's point earlier, should we email them to you? Like, you know, what's, what's the best approach? Uh, obviously, we can't continue this topic forever tonight in this meeting, but, you know, we will have you back and we will have additional uh, opportunities to, to share publicly. But in between, um, if there is, should we email you some, some comments, perhaps to Mr. Demling? That would be one thing. And then second, I think, um, you know, it's, it's uh, unfortunate that we're having this conversation right now on the agenda as opposed to later because we have a conversation about forum planning. And so we want to, Mr. Dumling and I have had a couple of conversations, and Dr. Morris as well, just about how to incorporate this issue in our discussions with the public. Um, but we also need to think about geography, you know, if we're going to be having some of these public forums here in Amherst on the dual language <laughs> issue, for example, you know, how do we also do that in Pelham, right, so that people have an opportunity to, you know, to, to get to where they need to be in order to, to share their concerns or their thoughts. So I guess those are my two questions for you. Mr. So, yeah, email is totally appropriate, and, uh, you know, I think, I think it will become clear if it's something we need to discuss as a board or if we want to come back and, you know, meet again on. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it doesn't have to be super formal, you know. We have, wake up one morning, <laughs> you have three or four comments or questions, you know, shoot them our way. It's, and you're meeting weekly, bi-weekly? How often do you meet yeah, now? Uh, once every two weeks. Once every yeah. two weeks. Uh, yeah, exception next week, we're adding another meeting, but we're we'll okay. trying to hit every, once every two weeks. Um, That's helpful. And your second question about forums. Um, so yeah, so we are, so the, the topic, the, the, um, the theme for our, our additional meeting next week is um, is scheduling the logistics of which groups we, we want to meet up uh, with and um, uh, what, the, um, what the schedule is there and, and what we want to do in terms of public forums. So trying to decide about the consultancy or, or not for that. Um, so we could certainly touch base like together, maybe Chair and chair about um, future plans there. To have some more clarity on that after our next, week, next week's meeting. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, to the members of the board for, for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. And Mr. Demling, I don't know if you want to say anything else before adjourning the meeting. I'm good. Thank you very much. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the regional school district planning board. So moved. Okay, there's a motion for a second. Second. All right, all those in favor, raise your hands if you're fine. All right. All right, we're adjourned. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, so moving the Amherst School Committee along. Uh, Superintendent update? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm.
So it's, it's a rather lengthy one. We haven't met in a while, so I apologize. Um, but I'll try to be brief where I can be brief and less brief where it's important to not be. Um, so it seems like a while ago, but I just want to acknowledge that we had a very successful first day celebration despite um, uh, the not cool weather that we had that day. So we had some water sprayers and fans, and we tried to um, do that. But just many thanks to particularly Jadira Torres, who, who is the primary architect of the event, um, as well as the many community agencies. We had 950 slices of pizza donated by area pizza shops, and all were eaten. So, um, uh, which is a nice number to have. That's um, but, uh, you know, just also all of our first responder, addition to the businesses and the colleges, um, you know, having the school buses and our facilities crew doing that, um, the fire department and their ladders, the police horse was a gigantic hit. And so, just many thanks for everyone who makes that possible. Um, and UMass Marching Band also welcomed students to Wild from the first day, which was which just always neat. Um, We've talked in the last couple of years about the Alana Cabinet, and so this year the Cabinet organized a kickoff event for all Alana staff members throughout the district. Um, so it's a nice, it's a little different, but it's particularly focused on making sure that new staff members felt welcomed and had a, uh, made a connection early on. Something that's going to be at the regional, uh, on the regional agenda on Thursday, but I think it's worth mentioning in Amherst as well, is that uh, we've had a request from a member of the public to conduct an ADA audit, an American Disabilities Act audit. So. All of our school buildings were built before the most recent ADA code, and so we know that our current buildings are not fully up to code, and the request was, can we find out in which ways are they not up to code so that we could work on over time rectifying the issue. And so Dr. Brady, thank you Dr. Brady, has been reaching out to multiple um, folks who do this work, including mm -hmm. some who have done work in neighboring towns and communities, and I think at the next committee meeting in October, I'll be able to share more of where we are with that. Um, but it's really important. We know, I mean, multiple, you know, just even from the last building project, which identified um, some of the issues, there's, there's, there's a lot of places in all our schools that were not compliant. Um, just this is a, a map of the open houses and the open house schedule. Um, last week, we had um, Jessica Minahan came in about um, reducing anxiety in, in kids presentation for more, to eight, more than 80 attendees, which for a non quote unquote required event like open house or structured event that way is the highest number I can remember having um, at, at you know one of these types of presentations. And many thanks to CPAC and the district for co-hosting that and the feedback was incredibly positive to the point where she couldn't get out of the building, which is <laughs> a good thing. Um, she also did consultation at all of our elementary schools on the day she was here, just you know when she was traveling to be here. So she was also working with our mental health teams and, and um, staff on how to support that mm -hmm. as everyone, staff and families are reporting an increase, not just locally, but uh, uh, much more broadly about anxiety in students, so um, well received. Yesterday, we hosted a RIAC meeting, the Racial Imbalance Advisory Council here in Amherst. Uh, RIAC has significantly increased its membership. Last year it was eight or nine people. We're up to 20 people this year. Um, some of the topics that were covered were, DESE has a rubric for district improvement, uh, so we offered feedback on that as well as the process. Licensure barriers to increasing the staff of color. We learned that the new commissioner feels very passionate on this issue, has a working group at DESE who will come out with information in the next couple months. The Paraeducator Pathways Program, uh, which we learned about last year and supported us in the application. So I'm um, doing Cunningham and Marla Solomon, who's from Five Colleges, Inc., um, led a discussion about that, as well as the current affirmative action legal case based at Harvard, um, which many of you are aware of, and RIAC may take a formal position on. So that was the topics, but it was really nice for people to drive out. We did have some call-ins, but since everyone but me and someone from Springfield is not in the 413 area code, it was really nice to people mm -hmm. make the trip. Um, I think I'll skip over the social media update because that's in writing. Um, so uh, speak a little more about the trip to Harrisonburg, Virginia, since I start talked about that. Um, so it's a MSAN partner district. James Madison University, which is a large public university, is in the same town, as well as Eastern Mennonite University, which they also have strong relationships with. Uh, much like what we're discussing, it's a strand model. So there's no dual language school. It's a strand within now five of the six elementary schools. They've increased the number of their schools in relatively rapid succession. A um, couple things that were notable, and I'm not going to read this, I'm just going to speak from it. It was last week, so it's easy to remember. Um, their public messaging was unequivocal that they were designing the program to benefit ELL students who were not achieving at the highest level, and they thought it was also, and research would say, that it was also a successful program for monolingual English students, but 
they were very intentional about the order in which they discussed those two mm -hmm. things. Um, it's not to dis discourage monolingual student English speakers from participating. There's lots of benefits, as we can talk. We'll, we will talk about later. Um, but both Katie and I were really noticing that their, everything in their language was focused on making sure that the program was designed to best meet the students, ELL student needs based on the, the results of um, their learning. Um, and, and that's sometimes a hard public message, but it was something that they felt very strongly about sharing uh, in all of their messaging um, throughout the program. And they feel like it's actually one of the reasons they've been able to design a program that the evidence would say is successful, that it wasn't decisions were being made with that in mind instead of um, other perhaps more political factors in mind. Um, there were many benefits that we have. And, Lots of debriefing has already occurred. Uh, just an example um, was, and we've heard this other places, but they were able to articulate it much cleaner, much clearer, was they, they have a waterfall model. And what that means is it's a 50-50 model of Spanish English. But let's say um, in a day, a student starts a day in Spanish and then in the morning and has English in the afternoon. The student then starts the next day in English and then flips to Spanish. And there were multiple reasons why that they found that to be effective. Uh, one is just from a teaching perspective, there's more continuity. If something happens in the, the day, you can address it the beginning of the next day. Mm. Um, for five and six-year-olds, not everyone is as available for learning at two o'clock as they are at nine o'clock, probably for all of us, but particularly <laughs> for young students. And um, whatever was the afternoon language they were finding was getting the short shrift, like the mm. students in that cohort mm. where the learning wasn't going as smoothly, so they've mm -hmm. had a lot of success with that. And that's one of the other key takeaways, and this has been all three of the sites that, that I've visited, is that you come up with a plan, and then you constantly are evaluating mm -hmm. the plan. And, and they had some nice language around that. That's what we do in English. Like, nothing to do with dual language. That's what you would do with <laughs> any implementation of anything. And so, you know, people have to, it's a larger change, and so there's a little more of a leap there. But the large focus is having a clear rationale of why you're making the decisions you're making, and then constantly assessing were those the right decisions and making adjustments over time. Um, so that was really helpful. We were able to visit two elementary schools and one middle school, and in addition to having conversations with the curriculum director or ELL director. And it was really neat to see a middle school. I hadn't been to one at any of the other sites, and because um, so, it was a staggered start of their elementary schools, it was the first cohort was in eighth grade, and getting to see those students and who had been in it since kindergarten was really powerful, and what that looks like in middle school. Right? It doesn't look exactly like the same as the elementary model, but they still retained a dual language component mm -hmm. through eighth grade. Um, Finally, having nothing to do with dual language programming, they have, um, and this is going back a couple years since we were talking about it, but they have an ELL newcomers program. And so it was great that Katie was there for that uh, from her ELL lens. Um, it was incredibly powerful to see students literally from all over the world. They have a significant Spanish-speaking population, but they have a, a large influx from the Congo um, as well. And the students in the Congo themselves speak multiple languages, mm -hmm. not all the same. And to see how students can be, can enter a district not speaking, um, many of them, any English, uh, and be nurtured for time limited, six months to a year, and what that looks like, and, and then how their transition to more mainstream was really, it was, it was fascinating to see. We got to talk to some of the students, talk to the teacher, and talk to the principals about that. So I know that wasn't directly related, but I do want to say that it was eye-opening for us. Uh, finally, um, we're scheduling a trip for some Fort River staff folks to go to Holyoke, which has a program, I think they're in the third or fourth year at Metcalf <coughs> School. Mm -hmm. And so if any school committee members are interested, you can shoot me an email. Um, we're still working on a date. It'll be sometime in October. But if you have an interest, then I'll try to let you know when it's loosely being scheduled for and then when it gets closed. So um, that was a longer one. I'll, I'll be briefer with the rest. Um, so. We got a federal emergency impact aid grant for displaced students. This is because of the storms in the Caribbean, particularly in Puerto Rico last year. Um, in addition, Jean Fain's here, so I want to acknowledge her. She wrote a grant um, and, and was awarded an NEA STEM grant, which we're really excited about. And the description's below, and I know it was emailed out and put out on social media. But you know, thank you, Jean, and thank you for your work. Um, something we talked about before, uh, the specialized, special education specialized working group. I was able to sit in on a couple of the meetings. Um, they're at a place of uh, con not just consensus, but unanimity. Um, they're still working on um, writing up documents. So they did ask to be on the agenda for October 9th to make a formal recommendation to me and the school committee um, on what they'd like to see, what they think is in the best interest of students moving forward as it relates to the location of specialized programs in Amherst. Uh, They'll talk about this next week, but the preview is they went through 12 or 15 different options. They, they truly exhausted um, 
all the different ways to think about this. They talked to other districts. Um, they did an incredible amount of work for the summer and then also in the fall. This is, uh, had CPAC representation from parents' guardians, but also uh, significant representation of staff who teach in the specialized programs. Um, it was in the newspaper today, uh, but Mr. Shea got on the roof, so it's a pretty neat article in the paper as well as neat experience. Um, for Mr. Shea and the school to cheer him on to reach the challenge. And Ms. Joyce, who's also here, uh, was the originator. As Mr. Shea told me yesterday, Ms. Joyce has a PhD in ideas. Um, and this is one of her uh, excellent ones. And um, just a lot of fun for Crocker Farm students and also great reinforcement for summer reading. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. This week, Thursday, um, Mr. Yaffe and uh, Ms. Estes Brown, who are the principal assistant principal Wild, would be filming. So that will be the next episode of window into ARPS, and thank you to Amherst Media for your support of that. And the last one I have, again, I apologize about the length of this, um, but uh, we're working with the Amherst Police Department on what ALICE, the protocol that those of you found out about the region last year, what that looks like in the elementary level. Students are less actively involved, as you might imagine, <coughs> in the age, but uh, we'll be, there'll be a training tomorrow during the early release day for all elementary staff, and then a follow-up, getting more specific, mm -hmm. um, and parent communication um, to come with that as well. But we want to just let you know that something we talked about working, bringing to the elementary level, because now the high school and the middle school have been trained, and we're bringing that to the elementary, although the flavor is very different, even how it's spoken about mm -hmm. with kids, and their role is, is different. Mm -hmm. Luckily, there's a lot of good resources. Um, Dr. Brady visited district in Eastern Mass that has had SALIS at the elementary level. We've talked a lot of other districts have implemented how to do it to, in a developmentally appropriate way, right? What makes the news is when people implement things like this in developmentally inappropriate ways. So uh, we are learning from both the good and the bad and implementing uh, what makes sense here to keep our students and school safe. Sorry, Thanks. that was a lot, but no, that's great. It's been Dr. a while. Morris, so, yeah. uh, any questions from the committee for Dr. Morris? Uh, Sorry if I was was here when it was talked about um, at the regional level, but what is Alice? Sure. So it's a protocol that has more active engagement if there was to be an intruder situation. Uh, or safety situation. So uh, to make a very long story short, and I can definitely at the next meeting maybe expand on this. Um, I'm just conscious of the agenda. I apologize. So uh, historically, our focus was all on prevention, and you know, so that makes a lot of sense. But if there was actually an incident, we didn't really have great directions for folks and research from places. You know, and I'm not going to mention tragedies because I'm not going to do it right now, but um, when when particularly adults were trained to be more active in um, responding to them, the, there's really a marked difference in results. So at the high school level, students are more actively a part of it because of their age and developmentally where they are. At the elementary level, it's much more reliant on the adults. So it's really giving them the skill set. I was in the training at the high school two years ago, and I was so impressed with both the Amherst Police Department on the way they trained our staff, and then they came to the committee, well, I think before you were on, I apologize, uh, to describe this, but also about the staff response. And um, well, well, not easy to talk about, it made staff feel more confident that they were being given tools of how to manage uh, and how to respond to critical situations where really all of our work historically was prevention, 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 uh, which always left that lingering question of, well, what if prevention doesn't work? What's our strategy then? Um, our, our staff members are wonderful, but they're not trained. They're not police officers. We, we wouldn't want them to be. No disrespect to police officers or educators. So how do we give them the appropriate tools um, to make the best decisions around mm -hmm. safety? Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Dunley, did you have yeah, um, I don't want to ask you a really long question, but this is so just 50,000 foot view. I just think it caught my attention with the RIAC meeting in Amherst, the, the um, licensure barriers to increasing numbers of staff of color. Yeah. So like, what was the sense from the group? Is there like a, um, do you feel, do people feel like that's well understood what those barriers are and, and what are what are those barriers? So <laughs> it's not a short question. Yeah, I think I'll say three things in response. So one is the MTEL, which is our state test, is everyone agrees that that's a barrier. Um, and the MTEL, we're a little unique in Massachusetts. Most states use something called the Praxis as their um, licensure assessment. Um, and it's not that one test is better than the other, but MTEL is really uniquely specific. It is uniquely specific to Massachusetts. Uh, whereas for many states, they can set their own practice score. So Connecticut may have a different pass level than um, Arkansas, but everyone's taking the same assessment. So it makes it hard for out-of-state candidates to come here and to pass. And there's also some feeling of um, how that test plays out, for, uh, particularly for folks who don't speak English as their first language, uh, educators that we want to uh, bring in and, and 
there's some some data on that. Um, I think everything else that I'd say, I'm just gonna actually leave it at that because it gets more in the weeds. But mm -hmm. um, I think I, we were pleased to hear that the commissioner has a sort of task force working on this, who will make recommendations in coming months. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Morris. That was very helpful. Okay, uh, with the committee's permission, I'm going to move on uh, to the first uh, item under new and continuing business, which is the East Street School Transfer to the Town of Amherst. So this is a continuation of a conversation that we started um, at, in our meeting at the, la at the end of August, and it's regarding the East Street School uh, building. Uh, property, which is currently not being used by uh, the schools, by the district, um, but was historically uh, held by the schools uh, for use and has been, let's say, tended to by the town, but uh, kind of left uh, a little bit derelict. So uh, Assistant Town Manager uh, David Zemeck is here today to help us better understand uh, the memo that he, he prepared for us. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I don't think we have copies of it in our packet, though. Is that right, Ms. Westmoreland? I apologize. I do have extra copies. You do have extra copies. That might be really helpful, because I, I just pulled it up on my yeah, uh, computer so. over here, but I realize it's not in the packet. Uh, if, yeah, if you want to just give it to Mr. Demling. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you very, very much. I'll try to be brief. I know you have a, a, a full agenda. Um, I'm joined tonight uh, by the chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, John Hornick is to my right. If there are questions about affordable housing related to the parcel, I'm sure that Mr. Hornick uh, would be happy to answer them. Um, to be brief, um, we have been talking about the East Street School for quite a long time. Uh, it has been approximately five years since the school had any uh, active use of the building. Uh, the committee may recall that uh, when Mr. Musanti was still with us, we were actually talking about and had moved forward with a plan to move LSSE into the East Street School. Well, as we dug deeper and that plan moved, and of course we, we uh, decided to relocate LSSE to the middle school, uh, we began to focus uh, with the trust and with uh, the community a little bit more on what should be the reuse uh, plan for, for the East Street School. Um, um, Practically speaking, the schools have not needed the building nor been in the building for quite some time. Uh, the town has invested a significant amount of money, uh, over $100,000 on a new roof, uh, various other improvements, um, and kept the building up, uh, heated it, uh, custodial services, etc. But it is still in need of a tremendous amount of work for any kind of serious reuse. Uh, in that vein, uh, as many of you recall, uh, at annual town meeting in 2018, earlier this year, uh, the town actually took a vote um, to uh, transfer the care, custody, and control of that building to the select board. So I'm here really tonight uh, partially on the advice of our town council, Shireen Everett, who works for Copeland and Page, uh, who really said, as she looked back in the title, I think a lot of us, let me back up, a lot of us thought, this is kind of done, we're through with this. But as we look back in the title, um, we really couldn't, it got fuzzy way back when as to who really had control of the building. Was it the town? Was it the schools? So Sharon Everett, uh, Attorney Everett, suggested that we come before you to get an affirmative vote that the schools no longer needed it, even though we have a town meeting vote. So really we see this as a formality, but an important one to make sure that the title is clear as the town works with the trust, which is part of the town, on reuse, potentially for uh, an exciting uh, uh, affordable housing or mixed-use affordable and other housing opportunities there, um, we make sure that the title is clear because the town would like to uh, move that property on to this higher and better use. So I think I'll stop there. Happy to answer questions about the property, about the land. I'm sure Mr. Hornet would uh, join me at the mic if have questions for him. So, um, I don't know if the, if the committee has had a chance to take a look at this memo. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we had asked uh, Mr. Zemek um, to come back uh, just to provide a little bit more background. Um, but I also attended a housing trust meeting a few weeks ago, actually, where the, the architects who are currently considering that property um, and how that might be reused 
um, were discussing the current conditions of the property and made it very clear that the, the property is in, in just very bad shape, so not really a building that we could use very easily uh, without a significant amount of, of investment um, if we needed to, to try and use it for school purposes or anything like that. So. Um, there is a motion before us, but before we get there, I um, just want to open it up for any questions or comments from the committee. Mr. Nakajima, do you want really to say something? No? I was going to read the motion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Uh, move the Amherst School Committee hereby declares that the town-owned land located at 31 Southeast Street, identified by the assessors as parcel 15A-20, and containing 2.4 acres, more or less currently held by it for school purposes, is no longer needed by the town for such purposes, and that said parcel may be transferred to the select board for general municipal purposes and for the purpose of the, of the conveyance on such terms and conditions as the select board deems appropriate. Do I have a second? Second. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Dunling? As Dr. Morris, I think I asked this question the last time this came up, but um, as I recall, this site was evaluated as part of the Wildwood Building Project, the, the standard part of the MCBA process required looking at all available sites, and it was deemed at that time that it was not appropriate for Yep. Use. So, yeah, um, it's, yes, so, um, I don't want to restate what you said, it was too small, and the wetlands in the back were highly problematic for any even expansion, and I'll say that I student taught in this building in 2001, and there were many, many issues there. We'll talk about the issues of our current building in a bit, but in terms of ADA compliance and other things that I mentioned in addition to all the other pieces, um, it was problematic, and just frankly, there's just not the acreage that you would need to do much with the site, um, and um, the condition of the building was not great in 2001. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Zomek or Mr. Hornick? Okay, uh, everyone ready for a vote? All those in favor? The motion is put forth. Please raise your hand. And it's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I would, for those in the audience or those watching at home, I would call your attention to the Trust website. Uh, Kuhn Riddle Architects has already uh, drawn up some very early conceptual plans for the site. Um, some of them reusing the, uh, the building and some of them not. But um, I think mo many people would find it very interesting to look at uh, some concepts for affordable housing on the site, and we're very excited to be working with the trust on that. So thank you very much, and we'll look for the next stage of that property and, and how it can serve the community. Thank you very much, Mr. Summick, and good luck to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, so moving on to the next item on our agenda, it is a communication plan for dual language. Sure. Dr. Morris? I just want to note that you're like exactly on time, so it's pushing me to think about how to get through this, right? It's all over now. It's all over now. I know, right? I acknowledge it. So, um, so I'm going to present, I'll do some of the presenting, and then Ms. Richardson and Ms. Chamberlain will also come up and um, do, towards the end, we'll talk about staff engagement. Um, so, um, so I'm not going to review all the school year communication last year. I think, you know, the slides, I think, Almost, it might be one or two edits since the packet was made, but essentially the slides are in, the, in there. So I'm not going to read through it, but I think the two important things I want to note on this first slide is there was an enrollment working group that drafted a report that really got the ball rolling as we thought about dual language. Um, so it didn't necessarily originate or derive from me or from staff. It really came from community members, one of whom was at a forum today and, and felt really redeemed and affirmed that the work that this member put in was, realize, was being realized in more deeper exploration. So it was actually a really nice moment this morning for someone to spend a lot of volunteer hours and then say, oh, well, people are working on this, right? Things are happening in that direction. Um, so I think that's one. Um, I think the other one that I want to highlight, um, there were many meetings with many people, um, but that we, we keep an active website link with the catalog presentations, events, and um, so that's on our, our website. Um, and it's, you can get to it pretty easily from, from there, but I just want to say that we set it up last year, but it's continuing to be updated this year. Great. So for critical stakeholder groups, you know, we really think about uh, the primary ones, not the only ones, but uh, families in the district or potential families in the district and faculty, staff. Uh, and we really thought about three key phases of engagement. The first one is, is going on right now, which is getting to a potential vote on November 5th about whether to move forward. 
The second one would be after that vote to when students are enrolled or families enrolled their children in the program. And then the, the last phase for us that we're planning at this point is, okay, families are enrolled, what does it look like from enrollment to this first day of school? Um, because each, three, each of those has really different, um, in some ways different stakeholder groups, or they shift a bit, uh, and different engagements that we would like to have. So the key members, so there's a larger group, um, leadership group, and then larger group working on dual language programming, but we have kind of subgroups or sub-teams. So the key members of this team, myself, Diane Chamberlain, who's the principal at Fort River, Renee Greenfield, who's the assistant principal there, Kitty Richardson, our ELL coordinator, Madi Reyes, who's the kindergarten teacher, or working in kindergarten potentially would be a kindergarten teacher in the program, and Julie Maramos, who's an ELL paraeducator as well as is assisting us with outreach in this regard. So uh, we're now two-fifths done with uh, visiting uh, preschools. We selected these five preschools because they send the greatest number of students to our district. It wasn't any disregard, I want to say, publicly for small, smaller preschools that may send students to our district. It's, there's a limited number of places that one can visit. And we're mixing up different people. So for instance, Madi, Julie Marr, and myself went to the one at the Community Child Care Head Start, uh, Community Action, Amherst Committee. The action head start, excuse me. Um, today, Ms. Richardson and I were at Spring Street. Tomorrow, Ms. Chamberlain and I will be at Cushman. So, d depending on the, the group, um, what was really nice, I want to say a public thank you to Amandi, who runs the Head Start, is they actually scheduled, that's the only one where there's transportation to the program. So, drop offs, not, a lot of these are happening at drop off. Um, but she had invited us to the uh, open house that they had at the program, and we had great participation. We had, um, I think it was 16 or 17 families represented there. Many of them signed up, and an incredibly diverse, linguistically diverse demographic as well at that one. Um, and Spring Street was wonderful this morning as well. The other ones we're mostly doing drop-off seems to be the best time. But it's been wonderful. They've welcomed us in. We've, you know, made phone calls. They said they've shut out communications to their families. And we had uh, Spring, Spring Street's a smaller preschool. We had a, a good number of families there, including uh, again, linguistically diverse families in the community. And Conductor Morris, can you just remind us uh, what it is that you're running through with these families sure. during these uh, preschool visits? So there's a brochure, which I'll get to in a second, uh, that we're handing out, but it's really a pretty loose question and answer um, because especially it was a little different at the Head Start because that was a formal time. At Spring Street today, our experience was that, you know, families come in, some of them drop off at 8, some of them drop off at 820, some of them drop off at 825. So you're not getting a group together to do a formal presentation. Uh, but it worked, especially with having more than one person there. It allowed for multiple conversations to happen. Um, and what I'm finding is sort of there's some disparity, but, but a lot of people have the same questions um, and same interest. And what's been wonderful, again, that last word is the interest that people want to know more and want to be involved and want to find out, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm that we're hearing in the community, both from native Spanish speakers as well as um, others about the program. And the questions are somewhat different for native Spanish speakers, what, what we've heard so far, than um, non-native Spanish speakers. I want to say English speakers because there's lots of people with different first languages in Spanish. But, um, but they've been really, I think, hearty conversations that uh, we're not getting out there early, I'll put it that way. A lot of interest. Um, and you know, again, the, thank you to the preschools for allowing us to come. So there we have uh, brochures, which include the mission statement that our, our larger uh, group, mostly of staff members, is working on, uh, has worked on, as well as a benefits document, which just got printed today. So we'll have that for the last three mm -hmm. of the sessions. We looked at a lot of the research because we knew in this community there'd be a lot of interest. And in what does the research say are the benefits? And so this will be on our website tomorrow, and people can click and get the hot link to that. <coughs> Um, I also want to thank the Fort River PGO because their preschool settings, they're not really open meetings. Like, you know, preschools in general sort of frown on strangers coming in when the three or four year olds are arriving. But the PGO at Fort River, you know, we're able to have a more controlled environment. So they've been wonderful. They said all are welcome at their coffee. The principal, so on Friday morning, um, Chamberlain, actually, we'll have multiple of us at that, that event. And for people who are in other preschools, as well as just interested community members can come to that. And that'll be a little more formal um, than a question and answer, again, because it starts at a, as a start time that everyone agrees to, more or less, um, at 9 o'clock. So that'd be helpful. And Fort River's also opening, uh, organizing an informational session at their open house so that for families who can't come at 9 o'clock but want to find out more, current Fort River families have that additional opportunity as well. Um, so we'll talk about forums later. I keep on saying that, but it is on our agenda. Um, I appreciate the chair and vice chair's letter to the Amherst Bulletin last week. I thought it, it 
it generated a lot of interest. Um, a number of people that I've spoken to read that and said, oh, that's where you are. So I really want to thank both of you for authoring that piece. And I also thought it, it very neatly dovetailed with what I shared earlier about Harrisonburg, where you talked about ELL students and then talked about all students. And it's not an either or, but I think the order matters. Um, so it was, I was thinking of your letter when I was in Virginia. Um, so it, that was, thank you for that. Um, one of the Friday updates, the weekly updates I do, uh, will focus much more heavily on this um, at the exclusion perhaps of other topics, but I think it, it's, as we get a little closer, I think it's worth sharing that with the community. And one of our goals is to open a question and answer page so that public can ask questions and get responses uh, in that way if they can't make it to forums or other ones. And we're already gathering. The more forums we do, there's a lot of common questions that come up. So. I'm not going to read through all these because it's a lot of bullets, um, but you can see we're doing, oh, this is really important to us in the family outreach component, um, especially as we get to, you know, all those other ones were phase one before, phase one before we all come to um, a clear decision. So at phase two, we really want to do, um, talk about communication and access. So, right, at phase two, a decision's been made, I'm assuming this is a positive vote, right? If it's a negative vote, then phase two sort of changes quite a bit, uh, but assuming a positive, or, or if there's a positive vote, I don't want to assume, uh, we really focus on how does everyone learn about the program now that it's you know, clearly happening, and how does everyone have access to, if there's a lottery, how do they find out about that lottery? Um, so you can see there's a number of events that are all focused on increasing our engagement with um, access to the larger community. So, you know, the banner like we have for first day, getting that on the town common. Um, sending information out, sending home library books in Spanish, you know, Amherst Bulletin, Facebook advertising, really doing a, a heavy, heavy um, load on that or heavy focus on that. Another thing we've been talking a lot about is naming conventions. Um, one thing Ms. Richardson and I spoke about when we were there is uh, when you say like dual language and non-dual language, because we're also aware there will be um, a kindergarten class next year in any scenario at Fort River that will not be in a dual language program. Uh, and even the way I'm describing it now is really uncomfortable. We don't like to define things based on what they're not. We like to define things based on what there are. However, monolingual isn't necessarily accurate because there may be students speak multiple languages in that class, even if the instruction's monolingual. There may be tutors, others speaking other languages. Um, so we're, we're talking about naming conventions. One of the things that we liked, or I'll say I liked, but I think there was consensus, is some, some schools name their, that have a strand within the school, they name their program. So for instance, in Wyndham, Connecticut, which one of our trainers is from, they call it Compañeros Program. And, um, no, so we're thinking of fun ideas and maybe there can be some community outreach that comes with that and a little more democratic process um, piece as we like to do with naming and logos and all sorts of things as you remember from last year. Um, we also want to specifically <laughs> outreach um, to different demographics uh, working with the LPAC, which is new this year with the Look Act, which is an ELL, what we are tasked with forming this year as a English Learner Parent Advisory Council. So having them have some ownership and connection to it as well as CPAC, and we, we ran an event last year with CPAC, but as it's getting more real, we want to run another event, and Mabe actually has some expertise and said they'd work with us on perhaps what that would look like. Another piece at phase two before parents make decisions, so the first decision, right, is what gets made by the district, the second is do parents want to have their child be part of this program, is really looking for that long-term commitment, and that's not because we um, don't love our students and families who may be here on a more temporary basis, but uh, the research that we've read says that basically five years is a good amount of time to re reap the benefits of the program. And if you're in for in a dual language program for a shorter amount of time, there are some questions about whether the, uh, the effectiveness happens. And obviously there's no commitment to stay. Families move for a whole host of reasons. Uh, but there may be some families who know that they're planning to be here for six months or a year or two years. Um, so many that actually every district we've spoken to has some level of compact um, with a commitment to stay. It's not like the binding commitment, but also around family involvement. Um, for Particularly for monolingual English-speaking families, it can be daunting. Uh, one of the questions I've gotten many times already is, do I have to speak Spanish to my children? Do I have to learn Spanish myself if I'm a monolingual English-speaking parent? And so we want to help families understand what that looks like. That shouldn't be a disqualifier if the parents are monolingual or the child, but particularly if the parents are monolingual English speakers, and be much more clear on what the expectations of parent involvement uh, are. And I think all of this, and we'll see this, in, you'll see this in a little bit, is really mm -hmm. about how do we develop a cohort model of families who are motivated to, the, to be, have their children be part of the program, are supportive of that program, um, because it's a, it, it is a sort of substantially different experience than their kids uh, will realize in a mm -hmm. non-dual language program. But eventually we'll have a better phrase for that. Um, 
but not yet. And so the third phase three is we have students, we have our cohort identified who are going to be taking part in this program. And we want uh, throughout, but particularly as that, that cohort gets emerges, to have uh, opportunities for them to offer feedback on the program design. We'll have many things in place, but there'll be many things that we want the feedback of the community. Um, build that cohort feel of families. That's something we heard from every single program is it's critically important that uh, not just that students are getting this intercultural experience, but that families are also having a, a mimicking, a mimic experience, mimicked experience. Um, we want to support a smooth transition, so as enthusiastic as people will be, they'll have logical questions and anxieties that come up, and we want to address those. And we also want, um, I think Ms. Chamberlain and her team came up with a great idea of how can some of the expertise of the cohort actually infuse into the school, whether it's Spanish-speaking lunch groups or um, think of new ways where parents can be connected to the school that don't really exist in our current structures. So we'll be exploring that with the families. So I'm going to transition um, to Ms. Chamberlain and um, Ms. Richardson in a second to talk about staff outreach, but maybe pause because that was a lot of information to see if there's questions, comments, or feedback on the, that part of it, if that's okay. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Yeah. Any quick questions or comments? So just to continue to probe in terms of like community general uh, reaction, yeah. um, so either from prospective parents or from community members, are you hearing any consistent concern or criticism of the program? I mean, it's been awesome to hear the level of enthusiasm in the community and, you know, pretty excited about this, but we don't want to lose the sight of the fact that we want to make a deliberative and, you know, fair-minded decision. So any, like, common issues that are, like, maybe are repeatedly arising that we're not yet on our radar? So a couple that I've heard, and certainly other people can share if, if um, Ms. Richards and Ms. Chamberlain have as well. Um, one is if it would only affect a younger child, this came up today, you know, and for families that are bilingual, they're concerned about what would that do in terms of the language they communicate at home with one child learning in half the day in Spanish and the older child not having access because the program's not they're already beyond mm -hmm. kindergarten. So that's one I've heard a uh, number of questions about zoning. Um, you know, that's not lack of enthusiasm of the program. That's about, you know, again, who gets in, who doesn't, that mm -hmm. kind of piece. That comes up quite a bit. Um, some questions about 50-50, um, not 80-20. I wouldn't say they're concerns that have come up. I think they've been, you know, they came up in today's conversation, and I took that as actually a good conversation. There was a critique of another district that actually does have an 80-20, so it wasn't, it wasn't a concern, it was more just trying to understand the rationale for that. Um, um, <coughs> frankly, and this is, I don't mean to be flip, or it's, it's an awkward comment to make, but concern that, you know, things will get delayed sometimes in Amherst, things don't happen at a pace that the community would want us to have, and that, you know, what's the, is people bluntly asking today, what's the roadblocks to this happening? Um, you know, do you think something will compromise, uh, something political will compromise this, um, this from going forward? And I, I don't, that, that could sound awkward, but I'm trying to give an honest answer to your question. Peter, I think, I think he means us. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> We're at a roadblock. <laughs> of a checkpoint. Yeah, I, I was trying to couch it as nicely as I could. I said they're really nice people. Um, um, and that wasn't about you particularly, it was actually about how... Me. Um, <laughs> no, no, or the, the body particularly. I think it was more just about past experiences and how sure. people have got excited for things exactly like that, like literally this. And yet there were roadblocks and things didn't fly in the end. I mean, there's people who still remember when this came up in 2002 or whatever year it was. And, you know, it was perceived, I'm not saying it's real, but it was perceived that it got to the, the policy school committee level and it didn't fly. So it's not about anyone in particular. I just want to be super clear on that point. I'm trying to look at Diane, Katie, from the community. Anything else, other concerns that you can think of? You don't have? Yeah. 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 There's other things we'll talk about for sure. Um, but those are the ones that I've heard so far, and I'm sure we'll hear more at the next three sessions. This weekend I heard a concern um, that I hadn't fully thought about, but it kind of came up again in your comments, which right. is this um, idea that there'll be the, these two dual language programs and then there'll be that other classroom. Right. And, and I think a concern about um, will that classroom be more on any number of issues, but I think this person in particular was concerned about um, in terms of students who might be participating in specialized programs or have other special needs, that maybe they'll be, that classroom will be 
in some way significantly different than the dual language program and how is that dynamic going to play out and should we be thinking about that mm -hmm. as we move forward? It, it wasn't a reason to not move forward with this, but it was something that I thought um, I actually hadn't fully thought out myself either. And yeah, so, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So I haven't heard that from the community. I have heard from staff and I think when we come back next time and when the special ed specialized working group comes back, they did an incredible amount of thinking about that Good. very question. So I, without, I don't think it's my place to preview that, mm -hmm. except to say that, um, and, and I also want to note that both Ms. Richardson and Ms. Chamberlain have been um, thinking, doing an awful lot of thinking about um, how does it stay cohesive as a school, and how do we make sure not just the student demographics, but that students and families uh, feel like they're all part of um, a shift, that it's not, yes, it happens over seven years with seven grade levels, but we want our fourth graders to recognize a uh, shift that's already happened in terms of um, promoting multicultural education and, and how students feel uh, in the school environment. So this might not be the right time to ask the question, but I thought I'd just ask it, um, and then you can answer it whenever it's right to answer it. Um, what's the roadmap between here and November 5th? What are the different topics we're going to talk about in the meetings? Um, just because it, we, I mean, over the summer we had a couple of meetings and we were digging into questions. As you, I'm just saying to the public, this yeah. is a, the largest audience we've had um, since last spring, or summer, early summer. That um, you know, we were digging around our issues around zoning and enrollment and different alternatives and things like that. And one of the things we kept talking about was um, the fact that there was just a lot of information to dig in. Some of which, you know, we're going to be learning, like what. Uh, La Siembra retreat and the update, there's going to be a lot of information from that work that the committee needs to be able to absorb. There's questions like the one that Ms. Spitzer just raised that are going to come up. And, um, you know, looking at the com I mean, communications plan is a critical piece of that. But I'd just love for us to know, mm -hmm. as well as the public to know, if we're going to have another three meetings on the topic, do we have a sense of what those three meetings look like? Or if we don't have it right now, could the chair maybe share it with us afterward, you know, at some future mm -hmm. point in the near future so that we can know where we're going? Yeah, so I can answer that question. And we did, and chair, uh, we did a lot of talking about that. So at the next meeting on the 9th uh, will be a presentation of the academic program. So that a lot of that came from La Siembra, but mm -hmm. it was a working group that met, like, of staff members this week. This week? Yes, yesterday, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, to really iron that, you know, get take more active steps. And that's where Harrisonburg was really helpful because the more models you have, the more you can make decisions on what makes sense in your community. It's sort of an odd feeling, but the more you see what lots of other people are doing similar and differently, then you can say, oh, well, we, we like that. We don't like that, but we like that from Princeton. We like that from Connecticut mm -hmm. and from Wyndham. And so that's the active work. So that'll be the big focus of that meeting will be the academic program. What <coughs> language is taught in which subject? How does I use the waterfall piece? So how does that work into play out in things? Uh, and then the next meeting, which we'll talk about at the end of the meeting, but probably the date will be likely change. It was originally scheduled for the 16th. Mm -hmm. um, that one will be focused on resources needed. Um, because I think, you know, the chair and I, if I can speak for both of us, felt like mm -hmm. the critical components before a vote, knowing that all the fine-grained details won't necessarily work out on everything, but having a clear sense of what the academic program is, what's the rationale for that program, and then what are the resources that we'll need to make the program successful, as well as the communication were the, the critical components. We'll certainly, we have zoning on there, as we'll look at future agendas uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, but in terms of the front end of it, in terms of the more at the school level, those are the next couple meetings. Great, thank you. Yeah. And I think if the committee has any recommendations yeah. or other things that you'd like to hear that haven't been touched on or, you know, um, please feel free to, to bring them forward. All right, so I think I'd like to ask Ms. Chamberlain and Ms. Resistant, there's just a couple slides on staff, um, pieces and engagement at each phase. So before we jump into the information on the slides, I just want to say kudos to the staff because I think they are embracing this with open arms, um, seeing it as a, a really a move towards equity for our students and, and see the value and, and asset this could possibly bring for the community. So I just want to give a shout out to the folks that have been digging deep on this and the literature that we've been reading, the conversations that we've been having are definitely steeped in research and literature on best practices. So thinking about trying to create a completely inclusive model that can suit all profiles of learners, as well as um, integrate all the strategies that we know are essential for second language learners, um, it's really at the core of, of what we're doing. So 
Um, some of the information that's happened so far that you've talked about is uh, we did do a retreat with many staff members um, led by the MABE uh, organization, and from that became, became our communication plan and early academic planning. Um, it, was, it was very fruitful and I think turned the tides around going from completely anxious to thinking mm -hmm. about things we weren't very seeking to really coming away with an understanding of the work ahead and, and feeling fortunate that we had a year to really do that careful planning. Um, we've been doing some updates at our first faculty meeting. Um, I think some of our faculty here will talk about the, the process of going through an entire lesson in Spanish and actually being immersed in that, in that what that feels like for kids as well as, as adults kind of stepping out of our comfort zone and experiencing it firsthand. Um, we have um, PLCs that are organized for this school year that people are opting into, so we're going to see that in literature as well, and then train our staff from within on instructional best practices. We're fortunate to have Katie as well as our sister principal Renee Greenfield who are very um, skilled and knowledgeable in how to teach second language learners and, and, and language instruction itself. Um, so a lot of our early release day time will be focused on those instructional strategies. So we are making sure that we're sheltering our instruction in the appropriate ways. Um, we've got staff that are really, really excited to go look at other programs, not only Holyoke, but there's a program in Wyndham that, that Mobby is associated with that they'd like us to go see. Um, our mission statement is up and running, um, and that was developed from last Amber as well. Uh, Mike has reached out and secured some um, conversational Spanish classes for our staff, which I think our staff is really, really excited about. Um, we also plan to meet by discipline around <coughs> both PLL, special education, as well as intervention services to see how we're still going to execute those um, services for kids while we're still doing a dual language program. Um, what the ratio is exactly down to the minute that we've been talking about this week of, of what's going to be instructed in English, what's going to be instructed in Spanish, um, and what kind of resources we need for that. Um, and we just, we know that the staff input on that will be uh, you know in various phases, right? Mm -hmm. So we're giving we're doing a bunch of sketching right now, but knowing that it's a, a process to make sure that all the services can be delivered in a way that works for the students, but also mm -hmm. the staff schedules up the whole school. Um, right. To your question, so I think that's something that's on our mind a lot is thinking about integrating services across the school um, and across programs. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a lot as the leadership team. I think we're doing a lot of the deeper research so we can present it to staff and present it to families and communities and then get feedback. So it's going to continue to be a cyclical process all the way through it. Um, so all these things that I'm talking about are not done. It's <laughs> <laughs> all still yeah, very much a process at the beginning. Slides, right? so, <laughs> I am definitely jumping around. So I didn't want to go through every single bullet point. I kind of wanted right. to hit some of the highlights. Um, we certainly want to do a lot of research as far as uh, doing a lot of event research and making sure that we open up our school as many ways as we possibly can to get people in to look at it. I know one of the issues that has come up is that whole wall conversation and how we make sure we're taking care of everybody's language needs without walls um, and trying to make the best of the environment that we're currently working with. Um, and the PDO has been on board and trying to learn as much as they can and they will partner with us and try to promote things as much as, much as possible as well. Any other highlights you want to make sure we mention? <coughs> we flip through it too. We can see if we skip anything. But anything else. I think the signage is actually, I know it's a small oh, yeah, thing, sure. but you have no, to talk about signage, that. you know? I mean, yes, so we want the place to, to not be a monolingual building anymore, right? So, and this is something we've actually started the conversation with our facilities director over the summer, who was a little swamped with the summer tasks, but we're already looking around the map of the school and saying, what do we need to change on um, an aesthetic way to make sure that when you walk into the building, you're seeing a Spanish world as well as an English world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you may maybe pause for a comment. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, questions or comments from the committee at this time for Principal Chamberlain or Can I just clarify, is GCC um, Greenfield Community College? Yeah, so um, I can speak about that just briefly. So uh, a couple meetings with GCC, they design, they have a language program, but they design... Greenfield Community Green College. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry, Greenfield Community College. And they design... Uh, workplace um, language course as well. So, for instance, they teach uh, Spanish for healthcare professionals course, and they'll, they'll teach it because it's a huge need in, in our area for that. Um, and so they are working, and, you know, we're not going to do anything, frankly, in 
a vote happens and then we can put some things in place, but they're developing a course that would be specific to uh, English speakers who want to get at a survival level of Spanish. So at least they're not going to be teaching in Spanish. We'd want people who are fluent and all that. But there was a, a huge interest that we heard from staff, which is wonderful, of how do we get to a place where we can communicate some in Spanish and how do we have a, a and GCC took that and they're developing what are the types of things that educators would want to know uh, to be able to communicate. It's not going to be teaching scientific concepts, right, because that, that's going to be taught by someone who's fluent in Spanish. And they're going to have a draft, I think, to us sometime in late, uh, late October mm -hmm. of what that looks like and then can get feedback from our educators of, like, does this seem right? Is this the kind of phrases you'd use? Is it, um, so they've been wonderful to work with. And, and that'd be open to anyone in the district. Um, but certainly we would house it at Fort River because it's going to be, you know, presumably a significant interest at that site in, uh, in particular. Yeah, a, a broad comment off of that is that it's, it's exciting district-wide. Um, I've had other educators ask. Can you speak on the mic? Sorry, they can't hear you. Um, <laughs> other folks have asked whether the, um, there are opportunities to learn Spanish even in the upper grades, um, just because of the increase in our Spanish-speaking population, mm -hmm. both students and, st um, and families. So just the way that this um, has an opportunity to open up that conversation and to make people feel like it's valuable and comfortable to speak Spanish in our school. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, I, I want to thank you for coming here tonight and also just uh, for the amount of work that you've been putting into this. We really appreciate we've been hearing that. Um, and I think, you know, the community, obviously, several committee members have mentioned already are, are, are expressing how excited they are about this possibility. And so we're looking forward to continuing to explore it with you and really understand what it's going to look like. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. But thank you so much for being here tonight and for sharing with us. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Dr. Morris, you uh, it, it, it can wait. Yeah. This is just a brief comment thank about you. thank you. Thank you. Um, Mabe also has written up a kind of summary findings from the La Siembra for us, and I'll be sharing that with you sometime this week, I think. Um, um, if it's just there's a little fine tuning and editing that has to happen at the last the last piece, but it can you know more accurately describe the work that happened and their recommendations. So they've been continuing to partner with us and offer us feedback throughout, which has been wonderful to have these folks um, who have done this in multiple districts supporting us. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, moving along, uh, the next item on our agenda is infrastructure discussion and public comment. So um, I see a lot of members of the public here tonight. Thank you very much for coming and for being so patient uh, sitting through our agenda. We really appreciate it. Um, so as I hinted at the very beginning of this meeting, uh, we were opening up a second public comment today, and that was so that we would have an opportunity to hear directly from uh, members of staff and um, educators uh, and anyone else really uh, just regarding some concerns that have been raised recently around infrastructure conditions in our buildings and our school buildings. Um, I think we've had some, some challenging moments during the past couple of months, especially with the start of school, uh, just in terms of uh, climate, you know, temperature control in the buildings. Um, but a lot of these are not new issues. We've been hearing about them for a very long time. So these are things that I think are um, continuing to be a problem in our in our schools. Um, and so we just wanted to give an opportunity tonight to hear directly from you um, about what you're experiencing and what you're thinking so that uh, we can consider that as we move forward in a lot of different conversations that we're having around budget and other things. So thank you again for being here tonight. Just a reminder, if you have a comment, you can come up to the mic, introduce yourself, please state your name, and you have three minutes. And just give me one second to get the stopwatch started, because I do want to make sure everyone's got uh, time to go. OK, so please. Thank you for allowing us to come here and putting in the second public comment section. I really appreciate it. Jean Fay, I'm president of the Amherst Palm Education Association. I represent all of the educators that work in the Amherst uh, Regional School System. And I'm here not only as a representative of the membership, but I'm here as a taxpayer. I'm here as someone who is married to a person who is a proud product of the Amherst Public School System, and I'm here as a parent um, of three children that went through the school system. And I've got some photos to share. I may ask some of the staff members to help with holding them up because I've got quite a number uh, of them. As you said, we have had a challenging opening of the school. The photos that are here, these are new pictures. And I also have packets for each of you that have pictures. Thank you. 
So these are photos that were taken recently, some as recent as today. But these are photos, and like I said, I have packets for each of you that have all of these pictures in them. So these are photos of filthy ventilation systems. These are photos of dead rodents that are in makerspace in the school library in Wildwood. These are photos of um, decayed carcasses of rodents that are in spaces that the students and the staff frequent on a daily basis. These are photos of the crumbling infrastructure in our buildings. These are photos of thermometers that show the temperature that the students and the staff were working in at the beginning of the school year. And unfortunately, I don't have photos of the temperature of the thermometers that showed temperatures close to 90 degrees, but that was happening. These are photos of the humidity levels in the buildings, in the library in particular, in Wildwood. And what these photos also represent are the learning conditions of our students. What these photos also represent okay. of the working conditions okay. of the people that are standing here. What these photos also represent are all of the times that the custodians don't have the supplies that they need or the staff that they need to keep, to keep our buildings clean. All of these photos represent the fact that we don't have the money to keep our schools clean and keep them healthy and safe for the staff and the students of the Amherst Regional Public School System. This, this is not a new problem, but this we're in a crisis right now. I want you to really look at these pictures. Amherst has always prided itself on great public schools. Massachusetts has always prided itself on great public schools. We can do better. We should do better. And we have to do better than this. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Elaine Stinson, and I teach fourth grade at Wildwood. Um, I've also been the union building representative, so I've heard many stories about the concerns of the building, so I'm going to share them with you tonight. Um, we wanted to begin by saying that the custodial staff at Wildwood has worked very hard to fulfill all the demands of taking care of an older building, but with staff cuts, it's very challenging to do all that is needed to keep our school clean and safe for students and staff. They're basically understaffed. When we returned to the building in August this year, many educators expressed frustration at the amount of cleaning and organizing they had to do to get their rooms ready for the first day of school. This included cleaning mold from desks and tabletops, moving furniture inside desks there was mold, wiping all services and cleaning up debris that was left by the construction. Our librarian shampooed several carpet areas that were moldy, all happening before the first paid day of the school year. There continues to be a mold problem as some of the bulletin boards covered with paper have mold underneath. Several staff expressed concerns about the number of live and dead rodents and feces in the building. On Monday morning, just this Monday morning, two staff members found that what they described as lots of mice feces covering their desks. They took pictures and then they cleaned it themselves. In the sixth grade quad, a mice fell from the mouse fell from the ceiling during the class. A dead mouse was found last week by Susan Wells, and this morning, another dead mouse. Feces has been seen consistently for the first two weeks of school, and it continues to be a problem at Wildwood. In the gymnasium and one of the special education areas, it's been reported to me that there's crumbling asbestos. Several staff members have removed their supplies and materials from this area until it's inspected by a qualified professional. Our school nurse comments that the Wildwood, that Wildwood has been reporting air quality and environmental issues for the 26 years he has worked for the schools. Our most recent survey 
completed in the spring of 2018 at Wildwood revealed that an elevated number of our staff reported having asthma, sinus infections, and skin problems during the school year. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Joy Woods and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Wildwood. I'm here this evening to express my concern for the environment in which the staff, students, and individuals at Wildwood have to work and learn in. As with any old building, there are prone to be problems and difficulties within the infrastructure and with within the infrastructure and with Wildwood, there have been many ranging from questionable air quality to issues of mold. Within my own personal experience, I've had to change rooms about five years ago from a room with carpet to one with no carpet due to having a severe allergic reaction to the dust mites and mold spores in the air. In addition, I obtained an air purifier. As much as I appreciated the efforts made by the made by others to attend to my health, everyone has not been as fortunate as I. The working environmental conditions at Wildwood continue to remain problematic. Even with the best of intentions to address the numerous issues, there needs to be more in the way of outside support for the Wildwood community, community that demonstrates transparency, action plans that are initiated by district administration, follow through and feedback that send the message of you are important. We want this to be a safe and most importantly healthy place to work and learn. Thank you. I'm Mangla Jagdish. I teach second grade at Wildwood, but I'm reading a statement from Liz Elder, who's te who teaches fifth grade. Last year and this year, there's been a noticeable difference in the cleanliness and upkeep of the Wildwood school building. I'm in my 20th year here, and I've never seen it this dirty or unkempt. The sinks are filthy, and I've been cleaning my own sink for the past year. The pictures I've taken show that they have not been cleaned since last year, along with the boot wells. Vacuuming is minimal at best. I've noticed that if something can't be seen on the floor, that part is not vacuumed. Our building is already dumpy, being as old as it is, and with the mishmash of furniture from tag sales and the founding of this school, and cast offs from UMass some 20 years ago. And now on top of all of the air quality issues, it's dirty, capitalized dirty. The bathrooms, sinks, rugs, and hallways are not regularly cleaned. Rodents, birds, and bats have inhabited my room for over the last year. Something needs to be done. These working and learning conditions are unacceptable. I'm proud to work with this community of teachers, but it's shameful that Amherst has allowed our school to deteriorate to this degree. If we don't have a new school building, it should at the very least be a clean and safe place in which to teach and learn. And I want to tell people, I mean, this I'm sure Liz would agree, this is not on the custodians. This is on them being understaffed and really not being able to do the job that they would like to do. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lori Hickson. I teach first grade at Fort River School in Amherst. I've been teaching at Fort River for over 30 years. And I've seen lots of generations of children and staff go through the school. I do want to say that um, I've been through a lot of changes at Fort River, and certainly I've seen lots of um, ups and downs, let's say, with the Fort River maintenance. Um, I must say, though, that it probably has not been this bad in my experience. Um, we can't really go any further without proper funding and staffing of our maintenance staff. My message tonight is that we need your advocacy. We have plans to teach wonderful curriculum at Fort River in both English and Spanish, but the physical condition of the school in some spaces is not conducive to learning. We feel supported by our administrators. We feel supported by our maintenance staff but they cannot do any more than they do. I have pictures in my possession. You have pictures in front of you of the Fort River Library um, with plastic covering their molding books, with swollen and broken suspended ceiling tiles that strain to hold back water, that pours onto them from the Fort River roof each time it rains, cracks in the walls that go clear through from the hallway to one of our classrooms, I have a photo of the HVAC unit in my classroom that was not blowing air at all this summer and into the first three weeks of the school year. The day it was turned on, faulty electrical wires sent sparks flying as my first grade children sat against the unit. 
during a lesson. The teachers and staff at our school could sh share accounts of mice and ants and a snake running through our classrooms and hallways, of broken windows that sometimes need to go unrepaired, of backed up pipes that sent sewage into one of our custodial closets, all the situations that no one would stand for in their workplace. We are expecting and requiring that our children learn here and our employees work here. These are unsafe and unhealthy environments. I want to be clear that we are supported. We do not blame our custodial staff or our administrators who work very hard with their limited resources. We need more resources. We need funding to keep Fort River and all of the other district schools safe and viable. It is unethical to allow these conditions to exist in any of our schools any longer for our children and staff who are there every day. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Griswold. I'm a third grade teacher at Fort River. I've been there 12 years. Um, throughout my time there, I've experienced personally different health issues due to, I believe, mold in the classrooms. Um, some of the side effects that I've had have been red burning flesh skin, sinus infections, um, I have asthma, and I do need to take um, a daily asthma medication as well as an allergy medication daily. Um, I find every year that I have to pack up all of the books in my room um, due to mold conditions. And so that obviously creates a lot of extra work, which I know other teachers are doing as well. Um, I want to say that I stay at Fort River because of the people I work with. I really cherish the professionalism of all the teachers and the staff. I appreciate the, the administration, and I care about this district. And I know that all of you care about the children, and that's why you're here, um, because we want the best for our children. And in order to continue to provide that, we need to provide healthier conditions in our school system. In June, I was personally facing a lot of health issues between headaches and fatigue, um, which I expect suspected was from mold and ran a personal mold kit and um, and this is not an industrial mold kit this is something that you get from Home Depot so I, I do want to acknowledge perhaps the quality of it is not as high as some of the air testing however it did come up with three different molds um, and I will leave this report with the board one of them is determined to be an important factor in the onset of childhood asthma. Another one, if there are large amounts of spores affecting individuals with asthma and those with respiratory diseases. And um, the last one often serves as an indicator for dampness inside the school, which we know that we have. So I will leave this with you. Again, I want to reiterate what everyone has been saying. This is not on the custodial staff, and it's not on our administration. Um, these are old buildings that have their own issues, but something has got to be done for the welfare of our children, most of all. Thank you. If you want to leave. I just want to briefly request that we come up with some sort of policy for the heat conditions in the classrooms. Um, I was ill from it and I was also uncomfortable as a teacher knowing that my students' parents did not know what their kids were exposed to on those days. I felt it was extreme and really unacceptable. Um, so I'd like the district to come up with some sort of policy so that that doesn't happen again. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Stephanie Joyce. I'm an intervention teacher at Crawford Farm School. Um, sad to have to report that our beautiful library at Crawford Farm <coughs> that's valued for 
not just all of the books and resources are there, but as a community space where we can meet with families and educators and our children for all kinds of programming. Um, we currently have seven leaks uh, coming from the ceiling. So we're also dealing with having to cover things with plastic and losing resources that, that we treasure that we don't want to have to lose. Um, additionally, we have a, a classroom <coughs> on our first floor that's experienced um, an antifreeze leak um, that's uh, coming from a pipe in the ceiling that we understand has been remedied, but um, that's concerning to us that, that that's occurred and um, uh, damaged tiles and other things will not occur. In um, a classroom that was next door to where I was teaching, um, there were leaks coming from the ceiling and the remedy of that was stringing plastic across the ceiling to catch the water and to have buckets catching things. Um, that's basically been the solution in the library as well. Um, like others who've spoken tonight, um, our children and the learning conditions for our children are paramount to us. Um, it makes a difference in their attentiveness, their engagement, the ways in which we can engage them in learning. Um, so we know that this funding issue is one that gets at the root of not just what you're able to make available to us, but what our state is able to make available to us. And so um, we hope to be back before long to talk to you about um, the fact that we have a future that's really going to depend on fair funding from our state as well. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone else that wants to uh, come up and make a public comment, you're welcome to do so. Okay, um, with that, I will close public comment and um, we'll open it up. Um, thank you again to all of you who spoke tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, very somber, uh, sobering comments that have been made. Again, unfortunately not very surprising. We've been hearing a lot of this for, for some time. Uh, Dr. Morris, I just want to give you yeah. an opportunity if you want to um, say anything before the committee. Sure. I want to first start by thanking everyone who came to speak tonight or to be here tonight. Um, right. I spent a couple years of my life talking about these very issues. They're very real, and I really appreciate people who are experiencing them on a regular basis coming in to speak to their firsthand experience. So the first thing I want to say is just an acknowledgement of staff for coming in. Um, this could be a really different meeting, given the conditions our staff and students are experiencing, and I really appreciate the, uh, the way that people express their viewpoints. Um, so I want to start by just acknowledging staff for, um, for coming tonight and sharing um, specifics of how they're experiencing things. There's no doubt that it's been an incredibly challenging fall, summer and fall, from a facilities level. I'll just list some of the major primary things that have gone on. Uh, so we had a major water issue at Crocker Farm. To make a long story short, the fire sprinkler piping was corroded to the point of leaking, so that involved the preschool, it mostly affected the preschool side of things. So that's not the leaking from the roof. This is um, other sorts where we didn't have water for a day um, and that problem was remedied. We had a cooling issue at Wild, which was which was referenced, the chiller compressor failed. Um, so one of the challenges with these buildings isn't just the age of the building, it's the age of the operational parts of these buildings, which many of which have not been updated since um, they're well beyond their lifespans. Uh, we have a lot of problems with our electrical systems, particularly at Wildwood and Fort River, which are made by Federal Pacific, a company that doesn't exist anymore, so it's very hard to make repairs, and that uh, has lots of implications. Um, for instance, we have a clock issue at Wildwood, which people at Wildwood know very well, which the master clock and the bell is not staying on time, which uh, I know it's not, seem might seem trivial to these other issues, but has large implications during the school day. Um, someone referenced the, the motor, um, the spark, the Univent issue at Fort River. So our Univents are really old, getting parts for them, again, not the easiest thing to find parts, uh, get them shipped because they're not in production anymore, and when the motors fail, uh, which they are prone to do, given the age of them, um, it creates lots of problems where getting excess parts that fit each unit event is not easy, so we keep excess, but um, that has been an ongoing challenge for many years. Um, we have had a rodent issue at Wildwood. Um, you know, I've myself had a conversation with Minuteman. Minuteman, which is our um, 
Every school in Massachusetts has to have an integrated pest management system. They're our vendor for the integrated pest management. And they've been in four times in addition to their normal monthly sweeps to this point. Um, the building being closed and vacant for much of the summer because of the updates to the boiler created a negative situation. Uh, I'm learning about this. Unfortunately, I don't know that much about it in some ways, but that mice have a tendency to want quiet areas where there aren't a lot of, that there's not a lot of people in and out, and that described pretty well wild with the summer. They're actively working with us on resolving the issue. There's some limits to what they can and can't do given that it's a public school and there's children involved, but they they continue to come on a very regular basis to address the issues. Um, and they're long-term. I mean, I can just very bluntly, you know, if I was at that, that microphone, I would say, you know, in 2004 at Fort River when I was teaching sixth grade, saw mice run through my room. These are, you know, they're not, it's not okay that they're ongoing issues, but they are ongoing issues that are uh, sadly not new. Uh, we've had some door opening issues at Wildwood, so our doors, our external doors that go from the classrooms outside are not, they're original to the building. So they're 45, 50 years old. And so we've shaved them down as much as we can. You remember there was a capital item last year that replaced those, and that'll happen. We couldn't do it this summer because of the other work that was happening, and you need a sort of quiet two, three week stretch without students to do those. So we've done as much as we can and resolve the issue as much as we can at the moment. There's one door that we may need to do over a break because there's one door that you can't, you, to a certain extent, you shave it down so much and it's not functional as a door, it gets warped. Um, we've had roof leaks uh, at all schools. Crocker Farm had a particularly challenged one that was, was referenced earlier uh, in public comment, but Fort River is, we could tell stories about Fort River as well uh, and the roof leaks there. So I don't want people to believe that this is a perfect storm. This is what we're feeling like is the new nor, oh, no, I think, I think those are the major ones I want to mention. This is the new normal. We have um, 40 to 50 year old, 45 to 50 year old buildings, two of them, with a lot of deferred maintenance. While the building project was going on, there wasn't huge amounts of money putting, being put into buildings that were hoped by some to be replaced. And now we've got a significant backlog of deferred buildings. And we've got buildings that weren't particularly well maintained for many years before that. There was not a lot of capital expenditures on the maintenance of the buildings throughout the history of Fort River and Wildwood. Um, so we have significant issues that we're facing. And one of the things that, if you remember our, our August meeting, Mr. McPherson, our facilities director, um, was pretty honest about is how long can we maintain these buildings without huge outlays of capital funds and is that the best approach or are we looking at new buildings and I think that's the conversation that the town needs to have that we need to have with the town I don't want to mean that, that we're not active participants in that conversation um, if the town's guidance is that we need to wait for MSBA to get into MSBA process to do something uh, that's large then my belief is that we have to have a, take care of these um, these issues one by one uh, over the next couple of years with a high price tag. And um, I think active conversations with the town is what we need to be involved with because none of these are small ticket items, right? The systems and buildings, and I'm not the best to explain this, and you all know that, they're interrelated. So if you're going to address the cooling and the heating, you're going to address both of those. If you're going to do something with the unit vents, um, that's going to affect all the other systems that are at play, and that's one of the challenges of improving some of the conditions of our building. I agree with all the comments. Our custodians working as hard as they can work. Our maintenance folks are working as hard as they can work. I believe this past weekend was the first weekend that we didn't have a maintenance employee working overtime on a weekend to take care of some issue at our schools since mid-August. Uh, it's been straight through that we've had people uh, working harder, you know, is not going to solve the, the degree of problems that we have. Um, so I, I want to there, there's no, you know, I'm adding to the somberness, I think that was the phrase that was used, of the conversation, but I just want to acknowledge the issues that were cited and acknowledge that these are longstanding issues that don't get better over time. They get significantly worse. I think as the climate changes, you know, not to get too much into that part of it, but there's more likely we're going to have more days that are really hot. Um, I don't anticipate that going down. It's also more likely we're going to have different weather patterns come with kind of more extremes of weather. And uh, right now our buildings, not just in the heating and cooling, but even if you look at the roofs, are not well prepared to manage the weather that we're likely to experience over the next five to 10 years. So I feel the urgency that is in the room. I share that urgency and uh, working with a solution is going to be a challenge, but actively working with the town on, uh, on what that looks like and a direction that they can give us, whether it's through capital expenditures over time or it's through another mechanism is I think highly warranted.
Mr. Nakajimi. So um, we've had a lot of conversations about the conditions of the of the buildings. I think what's uh, sobering about this is seeing all the pictures and hearing about day-to-day -day working conditions that are not, I mean, not that it isn't terrible to have, you know, over time building system issues that are failing and create uneven heating or cooling and things like that that are uncomfortable. But this is actually a mixture of things that are sort of long-term significant systemic challenges, problems around the outdatedness of the buildings. And then it's also about sort of day-to-day -day maintenance and um, cleanliness of the work environment. And so to me, I really feel, I mean, a couple things that are just, I'm going to throw out a couple observations immediately then for the question. That, one, I do think we probably should have a policy or some sort of guidance around the appropriate working conditions for when buildings are open under extreme heat conditions. I think that's a reasonable thing to request of the, of the district or of the committee, either one. Um, figuring out, and I, there's got to be comparables, particularly given the quality of the, you know, the absence of good air conditioning, thinness of the walls, you know what I mean, as opposed to someplace that's properly air conditioned in a different environment. So I think that's reasonable. Two, I think we need a more granular plan, and I actually felt like this when Jim McPherson talked, I forget when it was, but a while ago, um, a few months ago, about how, oh, hey, you know, this could all go to heck in a couple of years' time, you know, we have a cascading series of problems that are really challenges. That's true, and we all, I mean, I think, I hope I could say that universally, whether people's desired outcome is a completely new building or whatever, everyone hopefully knows at this point um, in this town that these buildings are not, I'm thinking particularly, obviously, Crocker has its own issues, but really Wild Wind River, um, need to be replaced in whatever form that is, and they're not adequate, and we know that, and we've got to have a plan to do that. We need to have a plan sooner rather than later to try to address the challenges of both buildings, whether that means what we've been looking at the Fort River feasibility work, if that means a larger elementary school building on that site. So regardless of great configuration, questions that also came up, that we could simply say, should we be trying to solve the, um, the facility challenges of both schools in one building if we get back into MSBA, maybe that should be a more active question and more openly discussed than we're doing now. Because I think it'd be a perfectly reasonable thing for people to say, look, if we get back into MSBA, let's try to, whatever whatever the curricular challenges or other ways we're trying to solve things, which I realize that we're actually, people have strong opinions and it opens up all sorts of cans of worms. If you simply focus down on the buildings and say, gosh, these buildings aren't good, they need to be replaced. So I think that's, a, that's something we should be dealing with and probably dealing with more directly than we are now, particularly while we have a feasibility committee that's looking at the site of Fort River, should we be looking at a 700 enrollment feasibility, right? As opposed to a 460 or something. I think that's worth talking about. Beyond that, though, let me go dive to the other end. Um, so Mc Mr. McPherson talked about a series of building systems that could fail over time, many of which are outdated, the companies don't exist anymore, it's really challenging to do. I get that. And that means there needs to be a more specific plan about how to replace things even more granular than we have now. But it's not acceptable to have, I mean, I'm, by the way, I'm not yelling at you no, or no, anyone I'm else. I'm just saying though. it's completely unacceptable to have dead mice and like, you know, mice, mouse feces. And to the extent we have moldy carpets or moldy books, that's unacceptable too, right? I mean, so the question for us needs to be, you know, how do we develop a more granular response mm -hmm. plan? that both deals with long-term facility issues, deals with the replacement of systems in which there are, I remember, I was on the Joint Capital Planning Committee, I remember that we looked at replacement of some of the exterior doors. It was funded by town meeting, awesome. Um, so yeah, okay, it takes a few extra months to get it done. At least we have a plan for that. That's awesome. We should have a plan for everything else that we can have a plan for. And then beyond that, do we need more custodial staff? I mean, I'm just saying, if we, if we do, Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the staffing looks like to try to ensure that the facilities can be cleaned regularly. And let's cost that out. And then let's have a conversation about how much money that would cost us either in terms of our reserves and our current budget or going back to other people in our town and say, hey, it turns out. Because I think everyone would hopefully agree that at the point you have like mouse feces and, you know, dripping tiles and stuff like that. That's an utterly unacceptable work condition. Our facilities, we'd be ashamed of that under any circumstance. 
And so the question is, I mean, I can't imagine that's a multi-million dollar fix. I'm talking in terms of the staffing and the cleaning and the maintenance. But I mean, to me, there should be an immediate response mm -hmm. in trying to figure out what we do and how we get to that. Then there needs to be sort of this intermediate tree dodging issue of sort of getting even more granular on building systems and getting digging into that. And then the other thing needs to be us being as realistic as we can be about what we're looking at around facilities. And I'm just, I'm just calling the question sort of mm -hmm. that if we need to have a conversation about a town about what it looks like to have a larger elementary school building built in the near future, if we get an MSBA in the next year or two, let's have that conversation. If that has implications for um, merging with Pelham and looking at that, let's talk about that too. If there's even talk about you know, looking at changes to the configuration of the middle school and the high school, where and moving the sixth grade. In other words, ways in which we could we could rationally organize something that could get us to better facilities sooner. Let's put it out on the table. Let's look at it and let's talk about it. That's by the way. Sorry, that was really long. But I'm done. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, sort of abuse my chair position, I guess, right now, uh, just because this this has been an issue that. Um, you know, when I first started having conversations with some of the people in this room and with Dr. Morris about the concerns that had been raised, um, I actually haven't been able to sleep. I mean, there's been lots of times where I've been uh, just so overwhelmed with empathy for, uh, you know, the, the people that are working in this environment day in and day out. And for our students, I mean, ultimately speaking, you know, we're all parents here, um, you know, we have... Uh, we're, we're living and breathing this situation, right? And I think, again, you know, none of us are new to, to the concerns and the critiques that have been raised here. Um, but at the same time, you know, with all due respect for a comment that was made earlier, um, that poor conditions cannot be the new normal, right? We cannot allow this to just continue. Mm -hmm. You know, going back and looking at the conditions that have existed here for the past few years, I was reviewing some old uh, fire department reports, and we've had continuous, for, for years now, the same reports over and over and over again. And it predates this committee, it predates this, you know, this administration. Um, it's something that's been going on, and as I think Dr. Morris mentioned before, you know, maintenance and uh, taking care of the infrastructure is just something that keeps getting pushed to the back burner over and over and over again. And at a certain point, you're going to pay the piper. There has to be, a, you know, a, a, a realization that you can't just keep deferring that. So I completely agree with Mr. Nakajima that we need, you know, there's there's two tiers almost. There's a maintenance, and then there's the emergency issues. And I hear that the emergency issues keep coming up so frequently that it's taking up more and more of the time of staff. But at the same time, we still have these other conditions that have to be taken care of and accounted for. Um, and I really feel that, you know, again, one of the reasons why I had brought to the committee at our last meeting this, con this you know, uh, discussion about budget priorities and setting goals for the district and including infrastructure in one of those is because there are definitely budget implications, right? That again, you know, if we have to have a conversation with the town, let's have the conversation yeah. with the town, right? I think we're all here. We've all been more than happy to advocate on behalf of our schools. And we need to at this point because we keep having different conversations about you know some of the the uh, problems with the the infrastructure and then some of the programs that we're trying to improve upon, but we also recognize that we cannot allow this to continue the way that it's been going. So I want to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I want to figure out how we have that in the most uh, constructive way possible. Um, but I think we have to do that sooner rather than later. Uh, Ms. McDonald and Mr. Dunling. Um. I'm not going to repeat everything you guys said because I, I agree with um, most everything um, there. And what I was sort of said in another way, it's really easy to feel sleepless at night and feel overwhelmed by all of this, and that's why I'm here. Um, and there's, I, I feel a real need for us to chunk this down and chunk it out, um, as you suggested. And you know, where my head was going is, what are the things that we can impact? I'm going to say easily, and I don't really mean easily, but sort of without the need for MSBA um, funds. There, there's some things that are near-term, immediate um, challenges that we need to tackle, and it's a matter of us prioritizing within our budget planning for this, for this upcoming year. Mm -hmm. um, what are the ones that are sort of, again, near to medium term that we need to be advocating and, and getting and working with the town and getting that budget priority, prioritization from a townwide perspective um, and that 
don't require, again, MSBA or long-term um, capital planning, but more, again, sort of the nearer-term things. Um, and, and outline not just what those things are, but what the impact is going to be um, for our staff and, and faculty and for our, for our students. Because um, I think it's really hard for people to connect these, these kinds of things to doors needing shaving. Right? It, it gets very abstract very quickly, and I think sort of putting together the list and then describing, here's a chunk of things that we can work on immediately within our current budget, here's things where we need more budget to do those, and here's the impact. If we do these six things, this is what that's going to look like. And then there's the whole other aspect of waiting, which, again, building on what you just said, Ms. Ordonez, is we can't wait for these things. We have to be planning and, and outlining what our plan is to do that, knowing that it's quite possible, hopefully likely, that we are going to have something you know, 10 years down the road in a new building, but what is our plan and how are we going to, to make that happen until we get there? So, I, I agree with a lot of what, what's already been said. Um, I think I think my ob objective analysis in terms of like um, how do we efficiently move forward is is to help organize like these sort of things that we're looking at. And I, I sort of break it into you know how much of this is because of understaffing, how much of this is because of deferred maintenance that we can do, and how much of it is because of just aspects of these really old buildings that we can't do anything more about. Right, I, I think I think trying to organize in that fashion at first will help, particularly the staffing issue. We heard from staff right. that they feel like there is understaffing of custodial services. I don't know enough to, to, to say whether that's true or not. We should definitely answer that question sooner rather than later. That seems like something really achievable that the school could do itself. Um, in terms of the deferred maintenance, it sounds like we need um, expert facilities analysis on what that is. Um, I remember a year and a half ago, when, during our first couple of meetings after the, the building project didn't pass, uh, we talked a little bit about this. And okay, now we know that a new building isn't coming soon. Uh, you know, what what do we need to do in in the interim? Um, so I, I think analyzing that question is what need, is what needs to happen. And I think I think we really need to set a very ambitious goal about having that done and ready to go for this year's joint capital planning cycle with the town. It's a pretty tall order, <laughs> you know, given how long it takes to get experts and contracts and analysis. But um, we should see absolutely how far we can get. You know, if we, I, I echo and agree with the sentiments expressed that it's it's this can't be the new normal. <laughs> that it's it's, and and I don't know the technical definition of a crisis, but if we're not there, then it sounds like based on what we heard tonight, we're we're it's close. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so we need to not be doing this in terms of well, let's do a study and then let's plan and then, you know, we need to take action uh, in, in, a, in a phased approach. Um, so, and, and I feel pretty strongly that that needs to be part of uh, the communication that the schools have with the town in terms of our, our joint capital planning. It, it may be that for a year or a number of years the school takes a bigger chunk of the capital pie than is normal. It may be that the budget itself takes a bigger chunk in order to address these issues, but I, I think I think we need to make that case, um, and, and and make it as, as as quickly as we can. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to mention, and, and this is hard for me to express, so I'll just do the best I can. Um, it's it, it's it's really hard to hear this with and not be thinking about the building project, the the, the failed building project from a year and a half ago, um, that I was a big supporter of. Um, and it was a really weird thing for me to be elected on the very day that it failed. <laughs> so I had this odd experience of being very supportive of it and, um, and immediately flipping into, okay, w what do we do in the future? And just having absolutely no sort of morning time, right? Um, and so I, I, I feel like if, if we're going to, as a town, come together on at least this point, on at least this point that, that this condition is not acceptable and that we need to... That, spending the money jointly as a town is, is the correct and right thing to do, that we need to let go of any resonance with that past project. Like, because I, I, I can feel it as, as we're talking about all these problems, you know, the, the resistance of, of, of it resonating and saying, see, I told you so, we should have passed that building project. And, and I would just, like, Olive Branch, reach out, you know, to the, to the people I've talked with 
in the past who have been strong opposers of the building project and, and just say, like, this, this is not about that. Like, we, we can talk about the design of a project when we, when we get there. Um, but, you know, we, let's, that, that's aside, this, this is right in front of us. This is about a capital investment that we need to collectively make the case to the town to, that, that needs to be supported now. So I don't know if I expressed that well, but I wanted to be able to address the point. Dr. Morrison, uh, can, well, can we do Dr. Morris, Carrie, and then Mr. Nakajima, is that okay? Okay. So I want to clarify, you know, because a couple of people have made note of it, which was fine. So when I described the new normal, I didn't mean the new normal into the future. No, I just want to say it for everyone here. I, don't, I didn't take it, your comment, that way, but I just want to explain that, um, is that the number of accumulating issues mm -hmm. that all are interrelated is concerning. And that's a different, I should have stated that way as inarticulately stated, but I just want to make sure I'm being really clear about that, that these issues, yes, they're distinct, but they're actually, they're, they're not distinct enough, mm -hmm. that there are relationships between, you know, some systems fail and then that taxes other systems that have to overcompensate. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was trying to express is when you have buildings that are 40 to five, 45 to 50 years old, weren't perhaps the finest construction when they were built, were built with issues that teachers were reporting day one of Wildwood in 1970, because I knew someone who did that, and he expressed that. And it weren't just about the open classrooms. It was broader than that. Um, that's the, the conundrum. So I just wanted to re be really clear on that point, because um, I, I, I wish I had said it differently, and I want to be clear on what I was attempting to say. And I think, you know, I like a lot of the feedback that I'm getting from the committee, and I think the challenge will be how to do investigate all that um, work in a, in a more independent manner, perhaps, that if we're really, you know, what I hear from Mr. Demling, I'm just not picking on you, but your last comment about prioritizing the schools over other capital projects, that's easy to say in a school committee meeting, and that's not, I'm not suggesting that as a negative, but it's perhaps harder when you get to JCPC or other needs, mm -hmm. because if they were at a library board of trustees meeting, I could imagine a similar concern expressed about the library. If we were at another meeting, I could imagine a similar concern expressed about the roads. And by no means am I suggesting that I don't want to prioritize the schools, but I do think um, if, the, if the conversation with the town is to express how dire the schools are and to develop a plan for how to remedy that, um, that's a different capital request process than what we've used in the past, which has been facilities director doing really different facilities director doing really articulate jobs understanding issues because we're talking about systems issues at this point which are which are broader so I think when we come to the financing issue I don't I don't know enough to give a clear answer but um, I think we'd have to have a conversation about the funds it would take to have work done to then present a report that would justify the expenses that we're all talking about I don't think it's I don't think it's the same process we've used in the past so Ms. Spitzer and then Mr. Nakajima. so I no, I I was motivated to run for school committee because, in large part, I care so much about the infrastructure and was disappointed also with the failure of the building project. But I think you, you raise a really good point that we need to move beyond that and start thinking, you know, towards the future. And, you know, one of the things, but, but I think we also need to learn from why that potentially failed. Um, you know, what, what, what were some of the causes of that? And, and one of the things I think is that I don't think everybody in the town is aware of what we just talked about in this room. I think everybody, you know, with kids in these schools, you know, and even then, you know, like my, my son's first grade teacher was among the people who just spoke. And I have to admit, I, you know, did not get any, you know, information about the conditions that she thought were unacceptable for our kids. And so I want to say thank you to everybody who spoke out, but I think we, we need to find a way, especially given the competing capital projects in this town, to get this message out loudly and clearly well, at the same time, and this is where I think it's difficult, is to emphasize that, you know, these are not, I love our schools. I'm a graduate of the, the, the schools. I send my kids here, and I, you know, could choose to go elsewhere, but I, but I love Amherst. And I don't want to put this, all of these negatives to say that, you know, we, we're not giving our kids a great education, but it just does seem like the people who work there and the people who go to school there deserve a lot better. So how can we get there in as short a period of time as possible in a town like Amherst, <laughs> where things you know often don't move as fast as we'd like? So I would second the like, let's do whatever we can to find a way to get the staff um, the support they need, if that's supplies or if that's more people. I, I don't know 
we hopefully could do that in the shorter term. Um, but how, and then maybe using our column, or I don't know what other platforms we have, but I think we need to get this message out there. Because I don't think, you know, as a parent at Wildwood and as a member of the school committee, I was um, taken aback by some of the um, information we got today. And I think it's also, nobody's raised this yet, but I mean, last time we got the report on the air quality, my sense was, yes, we've got five years and we don't know how long we can, you know, band, you know bandage this and keep it together. But I also got the sense that things are, weren't actually that bad when these tests were run. It seems like something changed dramatically over the summer potentially because of the conditions you were talking about with the buildings being closed, but, or something like about the, the, the way those reports were run. I mean, they caused me to question, you know, the information we got on the Fort River and the Wildwood, if, if, if the qualitative data we're getting from people today is also valid, and I think it is, then it calls into question, in my mind, what, whether or not the conditions that were measured in those reports um, were typical or, or not, I don't, I don't know. Um, so I'm rambling a bit, but um, so anyways, I, I just I, I think my, my final point is that we really just need to find a way to make this case and, and do it in a way that doesn't, you know, take away from all of the positive things that are happening in our schools in terms of the, the, the amazing teachers and the amazing students and staff. So, um, but I, I'm feeling this is feels like a wake up call to me, and um, I'd like to not lose whatever momentum we have to try to you know, start getting things moving in a way that, that, that we should. Thank you. So a couple of things. I mean, one, um, I, I, do, I think that if the school committee has to ask for uh, an integrated capital plan around maintaining these schools in a state of as good a repair as we can, I guess, and certainly a sufficient one to be able to meet the needs of the, of the academic and work environment. So whether that's a new approach for JCPC or not, I don't know how we do our work and how we do our work with all of you and the staff and everyone else if we don't have that information, right? Mm -hmm. And so we just simply need to have that. Mm -hmm. um, and I recognize then the game, I don't want to call it a game, it's not the right way of phrasing it. The challenge ends up being the negotiation over how fast and well you can fund things, but at least we know what we need to do. We know what we're looking at in terms of our uh, a multi-year plan. Um, that's one thing. Uh, the next thing to me would be, and I'm echoing something that has been said before and by Ms. Spitzer just immediately, is I think I would feel most comfortable, I'll put it this way because I want to be respectful, because one of the things that everyone said in the audience was they love the administration and they love the staff and they love the maintenance staff, so I'm not trying to be critical uh, of anyone, but we need a more immediate response like over the next, next meeting, the next two meetings, of what's the plan to get these buildings more clean on a regular basis and do we need an in-year budget request or budget alteration to do that or bring or what do we need to do what's the scope of it but we need like an immediate response because regardless of when the doors are replaced or filed down or the hell needs to go on I mean if we have people coming in with dead mice and mouse feces on the carpets it's got to be cleaned right I mean we that's not acceptable and so we need to understand how to respond to that and we need to respond to that Mm -hmm. Like immediately, really. I mean, I'd rather, I'd be more comfortable if you came back to us and said, you found a way to do it and you're requesting the alteration and it's already being implemented. You know what I mean? Like, right. I'd be more happier if you right. said, I'm already implementing it, right. but by the way, <laughs> cover my rear end and, and approve <laughs> this shift of a line item. Right. Like, because I, you know, I don't even want it to go on a month. Right. But the bottom line is, whenever that needs to happen, that happens, it needs to meet to me. I'd love to know whether the committee agrees, but I think that needs to happen as soon as possible. And then the only way we wouldn't want to try to proceed with that is if it really did cost like some ungodly amount of money, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, actually, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave it at that because I think the third point. I, I would agree with what was said before. I I think I think the, this committee should be thinking actively with you and others, uh, and and possibly with the town manager and others around what does the future look like over the next few years if we agree that it's not, um, if there's a general sentiment that it's not acceptable to maintain Wildwood and Fort River and triage this indefinitely, regardless of what the long-term prospects for replacing the buildings are and the sequencing, the MSBA funding and all that kind of stuff. Um, how do we get to a better place in six, seven, in seven years? Right. Right? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? 
and let's have a conversation with the town about what it means, and then let's work to get consensus. I'm going to say that word again. Right. Consensus in the town about what that future looks like so that we can get it done, we can get it funded, and we can get better facilities in the next seven years. Mm -hmm. I'm saying seven only because I think that might line up with an MSBA process. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let's figure that out. Yeah. But let's let's. But I think I think the committee needs to lean in on that as a as a point along with this new capital plan and this immediate response to getting the place cleaner. Yeah. And I would I would second that. I think, and I've spoken with yeah. with you, Dr. Morris. And, you know, it's really about uh, what can we do to support you and your staff to make sure that this happens, that this rises to the level of urgency that we feel that it requires, mm -hmm. um, and, and that I know you believe. And so whatever it is that we need to do, let's let's just do it, right? Yep. We need to, you know, to get this moving as quickly as we possibly can. You know, we need a plan for action for maintenance. We need to understand what's involved, you know, at, at a budget level uh, for all the different pieces that we've talked about. And, and I think, it's, you know, it's a great opportunity for us to have this conversation yeah. now. Um, you know, it feels for, for various reasons we're kind of getting out of an emergency sort of, in, you know, environment where we were over the summer, given the high temperatures and all of that. Um, but it still means we, it, it still is urgent and it yeah. still needs to be taken care of soon. So maybe we can do that in the next, you know, couple of meetings um, and help establish a budget process moving forward that for those longer range plans, you know, if it requires adding more money for, you know, uh, for staff, you know, if it requires adding more money for capital, you know, improvement right. uh, projects, you know, what would that look like, right? So we want to be able to support you and your staff in doing that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Demling, I understand. Mr. Demling. Uh, so just a couple of brief follow-ups. So plus one to Ms. Spitzer's comment about the apparent disconnect between the quantitative air quality report that we received and the continued qualitative evidence that we continue to hear, that this, there's something that doesn't add up between, it, it, just with the term mold, right? And, and if you just read the air quality report, mold's not an issue. If you listen to the comments, mold is definitely an issue. So, so what's the story, right? And, and I don't know enough about the, the science in order to say what, what is true or not, but, but something is, is amiss there. And um, I, I'm glad that we're a year and a half removed from the building project because it no longer, it doesn't matter, there's no building project that we're going to vote on anytime soon. <laughs> so, you know, we can feel free to say there is a mold problem even if you, you know, previously opposed the project. You can feel free to say there isn't even if you previously supported it. It doesn't make any difference. So hopefully that's completely unbounded and we can actually figure that out because it seems to me kind of a, I, we heard it a lot in the comments. Um, and, and I understand what you're saying about, um, you know, JCPC, you, you can't just walk in and say, ah, it's a crisis, fund anything you want. Um, and, and I, I do think there is something about the long-term relationship that the schools have built up with the town that we've, you know, in almost every circumstance, stayed within our, our guidance. Uh, we've been very respectful about the capital planning and, and working together. And as a result, uh, when it's been needed, the town has, has come to our aid and given us an increased budget in times when we need it. And um, so, you know, that being said, extraordinary circumstances call for extraordinary actions. And again, if this isn't an extraordinary circumstance, it's in the ballpark. <laughs> So we should do what we can to be as prepared as possible to say, we can reasonably say that this is what we need in this capital year, right? So while we're working on those short-term items that, you know, mentioned by other members, you know, we can, we, we can have something that, um, that we can sink our teeth into and, and fund for, for the next, next year. So I just want to appreciate the level of support that the committee's offered in terms of taking next steps. Um, I think it's a false dichotomy, but, but it's, it's worth mentioning that there's custodial issues and there's maintenance issues. And there's a relationship between those, and that's why I say it's a false dichotomy, but, but they're, they're related but not the same thing. Um, and, and to the last point, um, I mean, I think, I understand where you're coming from, Mr. Demling. Um, I just, um, what I don't want to do is put anyone in facilities up in front of town to try to describe some of the issues that really need more professional expertise of how you'd handle, because there's such large systems issue. It's one thing if the roof, we're fine doing that, right? But this is not, we do have roof issues, right, as you heard, and we have ongoing issues, just at, roof issues at Fort River, which you've seen a long, thorough report, which priced out what it would take to fix it. Um, but I do think a more comprehensive plan, which I hear the committee talking about, which I agree with, is not something that I think we necessarily can do fully internally, that we may need some additional support of how to do, how to approach that task. Um, so it's not a disagreement with 
that the schools are in, you know, pretty close to a crisis place. I'm fully in agreement with all the people here who spoke and, and the committee members. It's actually how do we um, show that, to Ms. Bitzer's point, to a larger community, and how do we do that in a, in a way that shows kind of, I like the language of short-term, mid-term, and long-term um, aspects. And so I agree with that. So what I can definitely do is come back at the next meeting with just some more thoughts about what's happened on the immediate level, as well as you know, some thoughts about on the, the larger capital level of what, what that would mean. What would it mean to bring in somebody to help us think through uh, the implications of the short, medium, and long term on the maintenance end? Because there's a relationship. And I'll just be very honest, and it's probably not a popular thing for me to say, but if you look at a per square foot basis in custodians, that's one way to analyze things. Another way is what are the, how easy or clean, how hard is it to clean a per square foot depending on where the square foot are. R, I think, is the right verb. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, been working for a while today, so it's a late night. Um, and so I think when we look at square foot, because that's our typical, the typical measure that people look is how many custodians per square foot of a building, and we do that both across our buildings as well as some you know, general standards. And I think that what that doesn't take into account is that some buildings are easier to clean than other buildings. You know, And I think that's the piece we have to add to our calculus that is not typically used, but I think in this situation is certainly warranted um, because the maintenance issues are certainly bleeding over into what the custodians are having to handle. Not that they're doing maintenance things, but because the maintenance issues are so problematic, it actually affects the ongoing um, custodial work in the building. So that we will certainly come back at the next meeting with some thoughts, more clear thoughts on that, as well as what it would look like um, plan forward to, to, to assess our current conditions in a much deeper way uh, not looking at new buildings or renovated buildings. I want to be really clear on that. I'm not looking for a feasibility study, right? There's an ongoing one. There was one in the past. But it's much more about assuming, not assuming any changes in terms of renovation or rebuilding. What are the approaches that would change the working conditions and environment for our students and staff? So I think um, it looks like the, the committee is in full agreement. We'll bring this back on the next agenda, yeah. and we'll continue bringing it back um, mm -hmm. until we've addressed all the, the different issues that we've talked about. Um, and then I think you know we'll look to you, Dr. Morris, yeah. to uh, you know help us understand mm -hmm. where the different places are that connect up with JCPC and the town, yeah. so that we can do what we need to do to to get this up to the level of urgency that it requires. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, thank you to all of you who came tonight. We really appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. And, um, and I'm, I was going to ask for a five-minute recess, yeah, um, if that's okay. <laughs> so can I get sure. a motion? Uh, moved. Okay. Second? Second. All right. Oh, well, Front of our table. Okay. Um, so calling a meeting of the Amherst School Committee back to order at 8.41 p.m. And we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which we sort of hinted at in the last uh, item, and that is uh, budget priorities and superintendent goals discussion. So there is a sheet in your packets that I hope everyone has seen, taken a look at. Um, and as a reminder, this came from the last conversation that we had during our meeting in August, um, where we initiated a conversation about how we can, uh, you know, call to attention for the committee and for, for uh, the superintendent uh, some of the issues that we've been talking about and working on uh, during the past few months from the last academic year into this one and hopefully provide some continuity, right, and a point of, of uh, you know, focus for us or several points of focus for us. And so just as a reminder, I'm going to review the, the major bullet points first. Dr. Morris and I sat down went through some of these, kind of uh, pulled them out a little bit upon recommendations from other committee members, Ms. McDonald and others, um, and hopefully came up with something that kind of starts getting us in a place where uh, we, we feel more comfortable. But the first item is uh, the meeting district's equity mission and diverse learners' needs. Um, and that includes things like the climate survey, but also professional development uh, across the district. Uh, continuous curriculum improvement. Uh, which includes, you know, exploration of improved curriculum offerings. We've been talking about uh, Fort River and dual language program, but also looking at Wildwood and Crocker Farm and other um, ways that we might be improving on those curricula. Uh, implementing a qualitative data collection protocol. The third bullet point is building on enrollment working group recommendations. Uh, so it's a, a carryover from the enrollment working group that did that excellent work last uh, spring and involves things like preschool options, enrollment, uh, and dual language programming. 
And then finally, and again, the topic that we were just talking about, which is capital improvements uh, across a district, and highlighting and bringing those up to level of priority for us, both through our budget planning process, but also for the superintendent and for the committee as we think through the things that we want to accomplish in this year. Um, so, Dr. Morris, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add um, about this, these bullet points in this process. Yeah, I mean, I think very briefly, I think the only thing I'll add to it, the chair said, is that, you know, it was trying to find the right buckets of work um, that kind of, um, and I appreciate the chair's point of view, that we want to align our budget priorities and the superintendent goals to be linked instead of kind of independent objects um, that may or may not have a direct relationship. And so, and also to think about what agenda items do we have in future agendas for Amherst School Committee meetings. So as goals are developed and executed, it feels like a natural flow to be having regular updates on these items. So it's not waiting till an artifact document gets produced sometime in the spring, but that um, the school committee is kept abreast and that we're having active conversations throughout the year on these topics. So um, any, I don't know if the, the committee has had a chance to reflect on these things that we started talking about at the last meeting. Um, if what we've put together here brings up any additional questions or thoughts, this is definitely the time to bring them up. <laughs> Ms. McDonald? Um, we, and I think we talked about this, maybe not at the last meeting, but maybe just offline. Um, one thing, I think these are the right buckets. I think one thing that, that sort of spreads across all four of the buckets is and as part of the implementation plan and, and that it's not spelled out explicitly and I think it should be, is um, communication. It's a communication bringing, we've talked already multiple times about bringing the broader community along and not just, you know, you know the first sort of order of business is the, the school community, but then also so many of these things we need to bring the broader community along. And how are we going to address that? And it, I don't see it as a fifth bucket necessarily, but maybe as, as something that's a thread that sort of is, is part of each one of these buckets of things is sort of the, the two-prong plan for bringing the school community along as well as the broader community because so many of these, the success is going to be dependent on that town-wide um, engagement and support. And that's all I have. Thank you. Any other thoughts or... Mr. Dunley? Um, so first couple low-level thoughts. Um, I'd be curious as to the reason for the inclusion of improving landscaping and physical exteriors of buildings. Not that I don't support that, but it's um, it's interesting to me that it, it's on a top priority kind of goals list. Um, so you can maybe speak to that. Um, ensuring all students have access to technologically rich classrooms that reflect 21st century learning. Um, so this is kind of related to um, something I've, I've wanted to talk about for a little while. Um, and I thought it had mostly a relationship to um, to maybe health class. And I'm not sure exactly where it fits, but um, like if I was coming up with a more like a specific, you know, goal, um, the, the the impact of, of technology and, and particularly um, attention demanding and distracting sources um, from all pervasive internet um, devices uh, it is a particularly concerning development uh, to me for um, a, a number of reasons. It really relates to how uh, attention is developed and, and how we uh, develop and maintain our ability to focus, um, which is obviously a core skill for students to, to learn. And this is the first time in which um, human beings are growing up with this as the default. You know, we, uh, as adults, I'm sure we've, we've struggled with, you know, putting our cell phones down and staying away from Facebook and all these other things that are, are specifically engineered to capture your specific attention and to hold it as long as possible. And um, if, if, I'm, if I'm sort of thinking 20, 30 years ahead about, gee, what, what something I would love a school committee to have been really progressive and forward about, it's, it's seeing this, this effect of, of, uh, about what technology is having on our attention and being able to empower students with the, the right behaviors and skills to be able to manage that effectively and not having the technology manage you. Because um, that really is the core essence of the problem, is that you, know, you have this attention, and are you in control of it, or is the technology itself in control of it? And it's, 
it, I, see, I see this concern bubbling up across all age groups and different aspects of society, and so um, I don't want to get anti-technology, <laughs> but um, uh, something as, as generic as just promoting technology in the 21st century, I mean, yeah, I get that, let's have Chromebooks and all that, but um, uh, to me, the more urgent need is, is this uh, um, you know, empowerment of, of how you manage technology. Anyway, that's a very low-level detail, but it was a low-level <laughs> item. Um, and then the other sort of thread that isn't called out here, but we've talked about it before, is just preserving and protecting the budget. Because, you know, this, it, the whole house of cards falls over if your budget goes away. Um, relates to charter expansion later on in the uh, agenda. Um, so I don't know if that has to be called out as a specific item. Um, but it's, it's something that's always on my mind. Sure. Um, I, since it's not really in here, I'd also just say <laughs> I actually think the question of trying to understand the impact on of technology on people, but particularly in this case, children. Although it might be relevant for staff too, actually, mm -hmm. for the for the learning environment, <clears throat> is an absolutely fascinating question. Uh, I've been hearing for years that the introduction of various technologies have have impacted intention. I mean, in some ways, there's some learning skills that are picked up that are new that are created by the interactivity and activity of devices that may, may be positive even, for all I know. But there are others around attention span and concentration that appear to be negatively impacted by technology. And so I know this is off topic because it's not really actually, I don't think it's one of the goals, but it'd be fascinating to see whether, whether our district has or could in fact even look to try to engage Foundations, experts, you know, research scientists, and trying to figure out how do how could we be a positive environment around learning, what those best practices would be, and how they impact classroom because in the classroom and also the learning environment, I think it's actually a fascinating it's actually a fascinating question and an important one. Um, having said that, back onto the agenda. <laughs> um, number one, I think is great. Uh, having, I think we, we, having continuity, a number of these things actually, it's kind of like the budget point that Mr. Delming just made, having continuity around goals, and I know Mr. Dennis said the same thing too, is really, really important. So the first one around equity mission, I think is really important. I think calling out the enrollment working group recommendations, continuity is also important. Um, for the capital acts improvements, um, in my mind, uh, were we voting tonight or are you taking feedback? Just feedback. Do you these are yeah. okay. So uh, yeah. yeah, these. Can I maybe take a step back? Because I think your question. I don't mean to interrupt, but I think your question will, uh, highlighted or highlighted the fact that I didn't do a good job explaining. I, I'm, okay. Yeah. I think I understand now, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. But I just want to make sure the committee members, you know. The, no, say whatever you wanted to say. Yeah. I mean, I can pause. Yeah. So Mr. Donis were to draft. I mean, just uh, I think it's good to be transparent. Mr. Donis were to draft. I offered feedback as priorities, and I would take the feedback I got tonight. To then draft goals that were aligned to the rubric and standards and all that. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, so for example, on the last one on capital improvements across district, I would substitute the conversation we just had for this. Yeah. Because I mean, even just what Mr. Demling said around, why are you talking about landscaping? I honestly could care less if your goal calls out landscaping. <laughs> um, what I would actually, what's more important for me is what are we trying to do around our capital plan? If they're short, medium, long-term things, what is that? Are we, do we have a commitment to try to do that this year? Are you going to be an education leader in doing that? Um, put that into words. And then I'm, I'm assuming that in the same way that you're talking about working with the town and figuring out how this conversation develops with uh, town staff and leadership, um, that'd be the same thing internally. And I'm sure there are people who can answer Mr. Dumbling's question around why landscaping and appearance is really important. And you'll talk to them. And you'll include it. So that'd be great. So, so in this one, I would just re, I mean, in my view, mm -hmm. my feedback would be rewrite it to reflect the conversation we just had and some of the urgency around that. Um, I don't really understand what implement a qualitative data collection protocol to capture the effects of recent changes to guidelines and policies, recommend a plan for adjustment as needed, and begin to execute against it. Um, I could infer all sorts of meanings to that, but I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so I'll let Miss, I mean, I can answer it, but if you would like to. Uh, I mean, this got expanded out a little bit from what I had written yeah. initially, right? So I think the, the idea was um, to sort of carry on a conversation that we actually started at the regional school committee, mm. which was, you know, how do we capture data about what's happening in our schools and, and apply that 
to our process for both superintendent evaluation goals, but also just what we're doing, you know, mm -hmm. here in the committee level and, and at policy making level. Um, and so this was an attempt to try to, initially at least, uh, understanding that, you know, perhaps at the elementary school level, we can't go about collecting survey data from students in particular in the same way that we do for older, mm -hmm. from older students, um, but we can get qualitative data and we can talk with teachers and we can get, we talk with parents and sort of get a, a different uh, sense of what's, what's happening in the schools. Um, that would then help inform a lot of our, our process. That was the initial thinking. So I would rewrite it to sound more like that. <laughs> no, because I mean, it's reasonable, obviously. I mean, it's actually critically important that we figure out how we mm -hmm. um, develop replicable, not unduly expensive. <laughs> Isn't this like the, it's like the golden fleece or whatever is the holy grail? Like, no one ever gets this, right? <laughs> but the goal, the goal of every social research project, science research project, is always to have, like, a replicable low-cost data set you can do longitudinally, mm -hmm. you know, and, and marginally improve. Um, that'd be awesome. And if it tied eventually to, like, it was explicitly tried to our strategic goals, that'd be even better. Yeah. So you're going to work on that? <laughs> so maybe I'll share some of the comments I shared with you yeah. that individually. So I think the other thing I shared with Mr. Dona is my, my actually significant caution, my only significant caution about what you drafted, I offered feedback, is that um, this is a really expensive budget priority and superintendent goals list. And uh, I'm going to be very honest with the same way I was with Mr. Dona's. I, I like many of these things in here. I believe in them. And I think what I'm looking for you, not in a yes, no um, binary answer, is that if I'm going to draft goals based on these, that that's going to be a significant amount of work for the committee to be advocating for funding to do these things, right? So I, could, I can't quantify each one of these four kind of bucket areas in specific dollars and cents at the moment. But a lot of them have significant financial implications. And so what I don't want to do is a... I don't want to set up the committee by working on these goals, drafting these things, get to budget season, and then have the committee sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. You're like, well, we wanted to do these things, but could you do them a little less expensive, right? Um, or maybe that's okay, but, but that was my caution that I shared with the chair is um, I think these are the right things. I think they're the right things to do. I think the right thing for students. There's no... There's not a lot of disagreement from where I sit in terms of what needs to happen and what's on this page. And, and, and I get the feedback I've heard, and I'm taking notes on that. Um, but this is not a, an inexpensive list of things to be working on and doing. And so I shared that with Mr. Donuts, and I want to share it in public with the committee um, because I don't, want to, I don't want it to be a setup for you all. You know, I'm not so worried about me, but I, I'm particularly worried I don't want it to be a setup for the committee to say, yes, we, you know, I write goals based on these, they get endorsed, and then I come back in this budget season, and, you know, it creates some cognitive dissonance between the school committee and the, t right, and all that, and, I, and that was the concern I expressed, or the primary concern I expressed. I hope it's okay that I expressed it here, but, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, just to, to clarify, because yeah. I think when you and I spoke, um, you're, you had shared concerns about the capital improvements in particular yes. being perhaps more expensive than some, because the other things are actually things that we've talked about, so there's not really very many surprises, and maybe you feel a little differently now. Um, and, and I agreed. I said, you know, I think that, yes, the, the capital improvements could, even especially yeah. the conversation that we just had tonight, um, if we're going to go down that road, that, you know, there will be budget implications and some of them could be fairly expensive. Right. Um, the other one that stands out is the preschool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, just to be, and I, I apologize if I didn't share that when we spoke prior. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I guess we had talked about something different, that we yeah. had talked about advocating for other solutions. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but it just, that has the potential of, someone paying for something, right? And so whether that's school committee or advocacy on that front, um, I just wanted to make sure that there was no illusions that, do I believe in preschool options? Absolutely. Do I believe in the capital improvements? Absolutely need to happen? Absolutely. But, but I also just, I want to be explicit on the front end that some of these goals may end up with price tags that are challenging, and then we have to manage through it. But I didn't want you to, I didn't want to get to January and presenting, here's, here's my sense of where we can go on capital, and then lead to some disagreements or, or um, where did this come from from the committee and me and I, I want to all be working on the same page on that front. So I'm sorry to follow up on this. So the, the first bullet under continuous curriculum improvement, direct exploration of improved curriculum offers including specialized magnet instruction, 
is that a, another way of phrasing, hey, everybody, remember how we talked about doing dual language at Fort River and something clever at Crocker and mm -hmm. Wildwood? This is the something clever at Crocker and Wildwood. Is that what? I'm, I'm yeah. using simple language. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, people have been to our meetings yes. and we've talked about yes. encouraging Wildwood. I mean, yeah. is that it? Yes. Okay. So um, my comment would be. So my comment would be. First off, by the way, I would reorganize these things to be more explicit about what they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's if that's supporting the development of specialized curriculum or programming, at whatever it is, whatever phrase you use, at Wildwood and Crocker, I would just say that as opposed to using language as a euphemism for that. Um, the second thing I'd say is don't be scared of multi-year goals. Right. So if something's expensive and it seems hard to do in year one, then you could accomplish year one of your superintendent goals right. by at least getting us along the path, even if it's a multi-year path. Right. If it's the right journey and it's the right destination, yeah. then the fact that it takes more than one fiscal year, so what? That's being realistic. we got to get there. We're working on getting there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's helpful. These microphones, by the way, are picking up like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like your booming sort of voice of God stuff here. We're not really. Kind of careful. Really? Oh, to us then. That's to weird. To us, it's, yeah, the yeah. feedback is That's so weird. weird. <laughs> Mr. Dumley? So, um, so what, do we, what, do you, what do we think we're looking for here in terms of process schedule? I'm always thinking about, okay, what's the final date that we are voting? Here are your goals. Like, what are we marching towards? I think that would help focus our... I think we, we could wander and have interesting discussions about goals for a long time until we actually have to get down to picking them. So if we sort of had, you know, I'd ask the question before, what's the latest we, we want to approve these to, so that, you know, it's fair to both school committee and superintendent. I don't know if we have an updated yes. answer. Yeah, so I thought, you know, I'd propose, I'd bring specific goals drawn from this conver conversation as well as a document at the next meeting on the 9th and perhaps approve on the 16th. That's what I was thinking. But I'm open to people? other feedback. Over that. I guess um, kind of going back to this issue, I feel like there are two constraints. One is, can we afford to do these, and are we setting realistic goals? But the other would be kind of like, when you initially look at this, does this seem like a reasonable amount of things to do in a year? I guess getting some feedback yeah. about what is... Um, it would be good to have reasonable expe expectations, both in terms of budget and also I mean, there are all sorts of other constraints. So I guess getting an initial read on, should we be thinking about whittling this down or should we be thinking about adding to it? Because certainly I think we could all do both of those. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll share my okay, thoughts, which is, um, this feels different than the last couple years, and I'm not talking interim versus permanent. So what feels a little different, and not in a bad way, is these goals, with the exception perhaps of the first one, are pretty uniquely specific to the Amherst Elementary District. right? So if you think about enrollment working group recommendations, capital improvement, yes, we can talk about that at secondary, we will actually, but mm -hmm. it's a different conversation, thankfully. It's a different conversation. I'm not saying things are perfect at the middle school and high school, but it's a different conversation. Um, <coughs> And so I'm, I appreciate the question. It came up in Pelham too. Just understanding that you know you have 43 percent of a superintendent working on these goals, and so I do have that concern as well. I mean, I think when there are goals, there are goals with more of a through line, pre-K to 12 and three districts that matters. You know, and, and I think the equity mission and diverse learners needs not that we won't look specific at elementary level, but it it is to a certain extent an everyone goal. Um, the other three feel. Um, Mr. Mungan is correcting me. It's 44% of a superintendent. I apologize. <laughs> um, speaking of technology use, distracting you. Um, and so I do have a little bit of caution. And as I was going to draft the goals, I was going to draft it with that in mind, to be very mm -hmm. candid. You know, in Pelham, this same item came up, and their percentage is not 44%. Um, and, you know, I don't want to go back into the realization conversation, but there is a reality that um, these goals are not going to be shared with Pelham, and they're not going to be shared with the region for the most part. And um, I don't mean to be, I mean, I work really hard, all those things, and, th and there's some finite limit of what can be done well. And so my concern always is quality versus quantity. Mm -hmm. You know, and I say the same thing with my, the staff I supervise, which is, I, and I'm not suggesting you need to, to follow my lead, I want to be clear on that, but I'd, I'd rather have fewer goals that are more important and done well than more goals, even if they're things that I like. Like, there's lots of things that all employees do that are not listed in their goals document. So I think the, to use, you know, 
certain activity might use it slightly in a different way, but have, I don't mean simple in terms of simple in terms of the content, but clear, understandable goals that are actionable, that are um, understandable to all, that are easy to understand metrics of how you assess them. You know, that would be my preference would be to take some of these pieces, and I don't want about landscaping, but that just becomes like a low-hanging fruit example of something that wouldn't necessarily be in my goal, right? Do we have some areas we need to address? Absolutely with that, and actually has implications of for facilities of some of our landscaping because it, it affects, I don't want to get into the weeds, we talked about facilities I think enough tonight, um, of that, and a bad pun that was unintentional. But, um, I was just going to say you yeah, had It's like the third time today I've had horrible unintentional puns, so um, Mr. Mangano caught one earlier, I think. So, um, so I think I want to try to draft something. That's why I'm not asking for the committee to vote at the next meeting. Um, and, I, and I don't mean to be flip about the 44%, but that is a, a reality. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to be frank, we've also reduced at central office, so we have less people doing the work. And, and that's a reality, and we'll manage it, and this work needs to get done. And none of, none of my commentary is uh, a critique of that some of this work needs to get done. It's just how do we do it effectively and how do we do it well, because I don't want to do any of these things less than well because they're, they're that important. So how do we frame that? And just to, you know, I think to add to that, uh, um, this was meant to be a dialogue, Absolutely. right, um, among the committee and with the superintendent. And this is not all supposed to be superintendent goals, right? right. These are also supposed to be budget priorities. Yes. And so, you know, I think it's, it, it mm -hmm. is, I think we're looking to Dr. Morris to help advise on what feels more like a, a you know, an actual goal to evaluate him on in the upcoming year or multiple years. Um, but also, where should we be thinking in terms of our budget, you know, priorities, right? And some of this, a lot of this, actually, is stuff that we've already been yeah, talking about. Absolutely. So this should, most of the, the things on this paper should not be a surprise. Um, and I just wanted to mention the, uh, because D Mr. Demling brought up the landscaping piece. <laughs> so <laughs> that came from a conversation that we were having around infrastructure, yeah. um, and just the facilities, but just the general maintenance around our buildings. Um, you know, you do walkthroughs or walk arounds, you know, you see a lot of problems there, right? And so it's a way of articulating, you know, all the exterior of the building, which is just as important as the interior. And for a lot of people, especially when first impressions matter a lot, you're coming into these, you know, buildings. So it's not to say that we want to spend thousands of dollars <laughs> redoing the exterior of these buildings when, again, we have so many pressing problems in the interior of the buildings. Uh, health related and others, but it is, you know, not to lose sight of some of these other things as well that, you know, that could be, if we have room for it, it'd be great to, to uh, figure out how to deal with it. Can I give a tangible yeah. response to support your assertion? Um, so <laughs> one of the positive things, you heard a lot of negative things about our schools, you know, tonight in terms of the facilities, and I want to acknowledge that. One of the positive things that we recognize is when there was overgrowth near where the vents were, it was actually then backing into the vents and contributing I'm to sorry. negative air quality. Uh, and we've solved that problem to a certain, you know, to, mm -hmm. to a large extent, and that is a really positive thing. And I'm not saying things are perfect now by any stretch of the imagination, but there is an interplay between landscaping and um, the building that's not, some of it's aesthetics, but there's there's some right. functional aspects of it as right. well. So I just okay. want to make sure you feel supported there. So to me, the level of, um, not to harp on this, but I think the level of the goals I'm looking for also, um, that's why it's what that, I, Definitely landscaping the physical exterior mm -hmm. buildings is actually very important, like technology and other things. Mm -hmm. To me, though, it's the wrong level of the goal right. yeah. to focus on that as opposed to, mm -hmm. hey, at the end of the year, do we actually have a multi-year capital plan that deals with long-term, medium-term, and short-term things? Did we feel like we effectively responded to immediate challenges or havoc of building conditions? Like, to me, that that you could boil that into, like, two sentences, and make it somewhat actionable. Yeah. And my God, that'd be incredibly important. Right. And I'm sure you'll deal with some landscaping issues where they're relevant in right. there. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, and we'll talk about them when we need to. Yeah. But but to me, that's the level that's the level of the goal. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 I might recognize. Um, so what I'm hearing you ask for, and and I don't know if it's if. if so I'm going to put the question back yeah, to you, is um, help in prioritizing these. So yes, it's budget prioritization, but what I'm hearing is also it's also your goals. What, what are 
the priorities for your goals. Um, is that what we plan to talk about at the the next time when you bring sort of your revised um, goals back? Or is that what we want to try and tackle tonight, I guess, is the question. So my process request, given a whole bunch of variables, is if people in the next week have thoughts on that question to either give me a buzz, shoot me an email, and talk through that, mm -hmm. because I think that'd be really helpful for me to know uh, before I start drafting. I mean, I think I got a sense from the conversation, certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think if people have specific thoughts, I'm really open to hearing, to hearing them individually. And sometimes people are more comfortable sharing that in not on camera, and sometimes people are co feel comfortable doing that. So people should feel free to get in touch with me in any way that makes sense to them to share. You know, if you had to pick, you know, what's the, the thing that you feel passionate about that you might feel like might get lost in the shuffle here or might not get lost, but you just want to reemphasize that mm -hmm. point, I'm very open to that kind of feedback and be very helpful. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, moving us along to the next item. So school committee forum planning, which we've been uh, touching on here and there. Um, so Dr. Morris, do you want to sure. take us off on this? Yeah, and I think I'll be brief to say that we've been to two preschools already and people are highly interested in you know, being able to talk through as more details are developed, and I'm not sure all of our preschool families that I've spoken to, actually I know all of our preschool families, wouldn't necessarily see a school committee meeting with the presentation as being the right opportunity for them, and that's not a critique of our meetings or your meetings, or, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's more formalized, they're not looking for the presentation you'll all receive next time in the academic program, they're looking for more, more nuts and bolts and asking questions. Um, I did, to Mr. Demling's point earlier, you'll be pleased to know, we, we may actually include some regionalization talks, and people said, what's regionalization? So I, I'm trying to find small areas to, to maybe emphasize that there's other things going on other than dual language programming in our schools. Um, but I do think when we get to October, particularly on the academic program side of things, I think there'll be a lot of interest in that. Um, and I do think having some opportunities for people to weigh in and offer feedback, not that it would be impossible afterwards, but I think just it makes more sense to this is what's been proposed, what feedback do people have, and, and have that process play out a bit. Um, going to the preschools has been great, and we now have a long list of email addresses and phone calls where people said, when you do another forum, here's how to get in touch with me. I'm highly interested. Um, so I think figuring out a way to do that and, you know, loosely talked about whether we can include some regionalization inf information in there as well so that we're not running multiple forums on multiple topics. Um, you know, maybe not everyone stays for both. You can't predict that. But um, I'm open to that idea because I'm imagining less presenting and more question and answer and conversation as opposed to our school committee, which would be much more presentation mode. Mm -hmm. And that seems to have worked well so far for the outreach. Thoughts, comments from the committee? Um, so the... The preschool parent, and it makes perfect sense the way you have identified the preschools to date, and, and I'm glad that we're going out and reaching them, but I think there are a lot of people who use, like myself, you know, family-based daycares and they're much right. smaller. And I guess they'd be welcome to attend the PGO meeting, but that's occurring at the, at the same time that you'd be dropping off your preschool. Right. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, um, given that preschool families are the most um, likely folks to you know, have opinions and want to get feedback on this. Are we going to, are there any other um, forums planned or, t or ways of thinking about how we can reach out to those other preschool families who may not, yeah. may, may not be in those preschools? Yeah, so uh, what we found last year was that, um, as getting old, I guess, it sounds strange to say, the... Um, the best way, because we asked people how they found out about the meetings we had last spring on this topic, and Facebook advertising, and I'm not like pro-Facebook advertising, it actually, to be fully disclosure, I mean, you can track who you're advertising to by age and all that, and I'm sure that's really effective, it feels very big brother to me, and I feel really uncomfortable about it, and many families, um, linguistically diverse families, because we can target that as well, responded, I saw it on Facebook. And so I think if we do have forums, making sure we're not just advertising through traditional sources, but last year's feedback was that we, we actually did some, and I'm not going to mention them because I don't want to 
speak negatively of the other ways we did it, uh, but that was by far the most effective way, uh, more than ways that I would have thought would have been better. So I think, you know, newsletters, posters, all those things, but actually uh, really investing a, a bit of a bit of money into Facebook advertising to gather more of those families with studio the email list for preschools, and they seem to be willing to work with us. Um, I think we don't have a list of all the home-based preschool centers, um, so we'll have to work with, you know, perhaps others to develop that list a little more fully. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think <laughs> there are all these, like I'm on a Amherst Moms list right. serve for kids around my son's age, you right. know, that he's six, but there are lots of moms on it who have younger children as right. well especially because they have siblings who are younger. And then also thinking, like, I would be happy to share information with the lists of both the preschools, yeah. but uh, the, the family-based ones. So, I mean, if there's any way we can help in um, through our social connections or just taking advantage of that, I'd be really helpful. I, I think that would be really useful because I think Facebook is great. And, um, with the caveats that you listen Sorry to be so yeah, negative no, about no, it, but, but it just, <laughs> I know, know lots of people use it and it no, but I gives mean, me I mean, that's the thing. I, just finding out about these forums, um, you know, I saw the posting of the the preschool ones, and I, I actually had that question of, like, are these open or not? Right. And I, it wasn't explicit necessarily on there, so um, I just use, I would love to volunteer my services, and I'm sure everybody else on this, I, I guess I won't speak for you, but I, as a parent of preschoolers, um, please don't hesitate to forward us any information that we can help get out to our our communities, because I've been learning about some of them myself as a community member and rather than as a school committee member, but I'd be happy to use my role as a school committee member to get out the word. Yeah. Too. Sorry, there's one other piece that I mentioned, the feedback I've received so far is that it'd be helpful to have one morning meeting and then one afternoon or early mm -hmm. evening meeting, mm -hmm. not, not our typical start times necessarily for school committee, but yeah. sort of late afternoon uh, meeting, and that's the feedback I've gotten, that if we did two dupl duplicated sessions, but different families that's going to work a little differently for, for particularly for families with mm -hmm. young children. Um, that was the feedback I received today and the last week. One other idea, just like at the Jones Library, there's Sing With Your Baby, you know, and I, I could just imagine that would be a really good time to piggyback on or even right. just go there and have somebody there giving out information. Um, I mean, there are these community events that uh, reliably draw <laughs> large numbers of parents. With, even this weekend, like at the Amherst That's family crafts yeah. thing, yeah. Is, is there going to be any, I mean, I'm not saying it's short <laughs> short notice to do something like that, but there are these events that right. um, might be a good place to kind of just have a presence, even if it's just some, but even if it's one of us, you know. Right. Be, or distributing uh, yeah, be there and be like, happy to answer your question. I don't know if that's a role you want the school committee to do, but I feel like we've been through this process with you, and maybe we shouldn't be sharing information about it in this way, but if there's brochures we can just hand out or just have a presence there, I'd be happy to to brainstorm about them. I'd be very open to sharing the work. I mean, I think, to my point earlier, right, there's five or six of us doing this between multiple preschools and multiple sites, yeah. and the more people who can share it out. And at this point, you know, again, when I was describing the format earlier, it's because we're a certain way along the path, and there's still lots of opportunities for people to share. So it is much, much more conversational, getting feedback. Um, it's not that we're, we don't have any idea what we're talking about, but I think, you know, I'd like to think about the forums happening after the 9th when we are very much more public about here's what the academic would look. I mean, I think for the average parent, that's the much more than the communication, or much more for the resources. That's the piece that they're going to want to see. What does that day actually look like for my child? Who would my child's teachers be? What subjects would be divided? How? Right? Those are the kind of things that the questions I receive now. Um, so I was anticipating trying to do those forums after the ninth, so that we're we're satisfying those questions a bit more than we can at the moment, and getting feedback authentic. That, mm -hmm. That's a little different than we can before we present something. Right. right. And I think just to add to that last point, um, you know, to me, I think there's there's um, a distinction that we need to make too with providing information, soliciting information, soliciting feedback, right? And, and the forums can help play that role because obviously you're having that conversation in real time with families and the community. Um, and and I think that you know part of the idea for the this agenda item was also just to think about um, a few of the other items that we've been talking yeah. about that we want to bring to the community and solicit some of that feedback on, right? Um, so I think dual language is definitely one of those things that a lot of people are really excited about, but we, we also have to communicate with a lot of families to let them know that 
this won't apply to them necessarily, right? This is going to be, you know, for, you know, at least in the beginning uh, and, and probably for quite some time for much younger children coming into the school system. And so if there is an expectation or a hope that some community members and families are holding on to that their kids may be able to, you know, to do this, we have to, to be able to share with them that that's not going to be the case. We also want to share with them, you know, again, the magnet school idea that we've been talking right. about. Um, you know, the, for Wildwood and for Crocker Farm, like what does that look like? So that's an opportunity to share information and also get their thinking back on that to see if that makes sense. We're not going to hear a lot of those presentations until the spring, but at least floating the idea and getting some input, you know, seems to make a lot of sense at this point in time. But then I just want to bring the committee back to the, the question that we raised earlier about the regionalization with Pelham that, you know, this is an opportunity, if we were to have, imagine, a larger forum, you know, among the community, and I'm, I'm just, I'm actually, I think it's a question for us to think about, would we want to do something like that where we actually raise several of these different issues or questions that we're currently grappling with, um, and not just, you know, the, I think strictly speaking can provide us with a lot of good information, it's also just another touch point with the community, right? Mm -hmm. Where they don't necessarily, if they're not coming to a meeting, they don't get to hear from us, they don't get to see what we're thinking or talking about. You know, a forum offers that more informal kind of opportunity. Yeah. It's like a, you know, a town hall, I guess, that you'd think about with a lot of, uh, you know, elected officials that will hold in their campaigning. We're not campaigning, clearly, um, but we, we are, you know, eager to hear from the community on a bunch of different things. So. With that, uh, Mr. Nakajima and Ms. McDonald. So uh, <clears throat> um, I think I understand better what we're talking about than I did at the beginning. I felt like I missed a meeting or something. Um, <laughs> I was also nope. confused. <laughs> yeah. Good, yeah. Uh, well, I, let's not shoehorn everything into every meeting. Right. I, think the, I think the idea of engaging the public and doing forums over the course of this coming year is a really good goal for us to have as a committee. Um, there are going to be different topics I think that will be ripe for discussion at different points. Um, just for example, I don't even know how we'd, I don't know how we would get through this year and survive as committee members if we didn't at some point have a discussion with the public around capital, a capital plan <laughs> and improvements <laughs> to the buildings, right? But we're obviously utterly unprepared. I mean, I don't mean in a negative way. We just started talking about yeah. needing to do this tonight. We know we can't even have that conversation probably until late winter or something like that or whatever. But something like that time frame. So that would be a good time to have that discussion around facilities, the facilities plan and how we're approaching that. That's also something where a lot of the other work we're doing will be further down the line. Um, but obviously we should be doing dual language next month. I mean, I still think, I still think though, and this goes to something that Mr. Jones is just saying, the, the conversations we had previously around how Wildwood and Crocker were sort of internally thinking through their aspirations seems slow in terms of where it intersects with the public conversation. And I think we need to find different ways of talking about it because I, I worry, especially with the comment being made around, we're talking about kindergartners mm -hmm. next fall, right. maybe right. in like two sections or something like that. Right. That leaves out an awful lot leaves almost all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. kids in our district and families in our district. And so we've got to have a conversation where even if it's being alluded to, discussed, previewed, we've got to do something even at these early forums mm -hmm. to, to engage people around the fact that there is more going on than just this. It could be a lot of disappointment otherwise. Oh, gosh. Yes. <laughs> so I, I love, I, I personally love the idea of having sort of multi-topic forums, because um, I think that there's a lot of people that are a little bit interested in multiple topics, but not enough to sort of get out and go out to the high school or the middle school at 7 o'clock on a weeknight to hear about just one thing, or to ask their one question that they have. And I think sort of pooling a couple topics together on, you know, I also like the idea of the sort of maybe a quarterly basis, I think rotating topics could be really interesting um, that can get more people engaged, hear a little bit about multiple things, and might encourage folks to engage more because they're, they're not committing at, you know, a weeknight to just one thing, but they'll hear a little bit about several things that they're really curious and interested in about. Um, and I do think pair, pairing the 
regional um, elementary regionalization is a good one because I, I do get the sense that it's it's abstract how is it going to impact me and people aren't really engaging it in it and uh, the idea of drawing people into that a conversation just on regionalization seems like we'll have a small group and yet everybody's going to be a little bit interested in that topic as well um, so I do like the idea and I, I for some reason it popped in my head the CPAC event that was here, mm -hmm. um, you know, having stations, right? So it could be a, a true mm -hmm. forum or it could be sort of a round robin station set up and sort of a give and take and people can sort of move around um, mm -hmm. and have conversations or formal presentation and Q&A. Um, so I, I think having the multi-topics opens up sort of other creative ways to really engage um, personally with, with the community. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I really like that idea, that sort of the idea of like having a regularly pulsed opportunity for the community to engage with the school committee uh, on, a, on an informal basis. Like people talk all the time about how it's great that you have public comment, but it's really a strained structure. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not the most conducive to harmonious back and forth dialogue, because there is no back and forth dialogue, right? And I have great conversations with members of the community about school committee topics, but that's just because I meet them somewhere or I know them, and then we have like an in-depth back and forth. So wouldn't it be great if everybody had that opportunity and didn't have to like you know have a personal relationship with a school committee member or um, or be so intensely affected by one issue that you would get the babysitter and move out in that way? You know? <laughs> and and I think also you know increasing the visibility of, of the school committee and, and not for our own personal edification, but but where the interface um, with with what's going on in the schools. And so whether it's, um, you know, I, I, I think it can, be, it can be done where you say, okay, the, the primary theme of tonight is dual language. And you give a, a short, like a five minute, something to react to thing, and then, um, and then open it up for Q&A. Or you give two really short presentations, then you open it up to Q&A and have it back and forth. I'm, I'm thinking about the, um, the time when we did do this uh, a year, was it a year ago now? Um, on the, the school building, Fort Rivers Feasibility Study Committee. And we had forums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, and that was interesting because it was still in a, a fairly tense time <laughs> after the school building project, and so there was there was that extra layer of. Mm -hmm. But even then, I I thought people uh, reacted to it um, positively. It, mm -hmm. it, it more of an open-ended flow than obviously a, a strict agenda has, and so yeah, I, I really like that. And I'm glad that Mr. Nakajima said he was confused as well. <laughs> he started talking about preschool outreach, and didn't know what we were talking about, but so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe we can continue this conversation um, as, as I go back. And so next week we're talking about public forums and how we engage that. And I could certainly imagine like both things happening. You know, where we have something very specific about regionalization, and yet we also try and piggyback off of a school committee um, more open-ended forum. Yeah, the only caveat I'd put on it. Sorry, I'm doing a lot of that tonight. But um, is that I think the distinction between some of these items and dual languages. There's a vote. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I'm hearing in the community is like, when is a vote happening and how do I influence a vote? And so I get the piece and I get the concern about, you know, we're not talking about Wildwood and, and Crocker Farm as much at the moment. I think things will shift after a vote happens, um, but I do think uh, a lot of the resources are being marshaled to do the work that gets myself as well as, you know, hopefully the community and, and you all comfortable with moving forward with that. And so I think that's the tension point for me. It's not that at the exclusion of those schools, but how many things can we fit on an agenda? How many things can we present? And I, I know it's I'm pushing a false dichotomy to a certain extent, but there is some element of what I'm hearing in the community. It's not that people are dissatisfied of Wildwood or Quaker Farm, but people are like, is this going to happen? Like what, what I shared earlier. And, and I think that's perhaps the only caution point about combining it as a multi-topic is that that's a single topic issue that some people are only going to come because that's the topic because they want to influence or voice concerns or support or whatever they want to do on something that's a formal vote of the school committee as part of a normal agenda that would occur. So to me, this is like a communications or rhetoric challenge. Right. Um, I just think at the beginning, I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree about focusing on dual language and maybe regionalization as two core topics, let's say. Um, but I don't see any reason why, I mean, so the, the question is, if you have a 15 slide deck, right. you can mention the fact we're doing planning with Crocker and Wildwood on slide 14, right. after people are already like zoned out on basically everything they've learned, 
and then it both looks, feels, and acts like an afterthought. Right. Um, or at the beginning, you can say there are really exciting things happening right. at all three of our elementary schools. And who knows, maybe there'll be a fourth one in the near future. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, and, yeah. and here's what they are. Um, in, the, in November or December right. or whenever it's going to be, we're going to come back to you with what's going on at Crocker or Wildwood. Um, and we're really excited about it. But tonight we really are trying to focus on, mm -hmm. and I think if that framing happens that way, yeah. then That's everyone awesome. gets it. Mm -hmm. they, they hear what's going on, but they also feel valued. And they say, oh, okay, There's, there is something going on. And, you know. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. So to me, that's, so I put it on slide one, not slide 14. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And just frame it up that way. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Can I ask a logistical question about forums um, and open meeting law? I guess part of, you know, the, the reason we do the things we, the way we do them is to be in compliance with that. And so with these forums, if, would we have to make sure we don't have a quorum of us there? If we're this, or we just call, call the meeting. We call, call a meeting. Them, yeah. And then do we need to have minutes taken mm -hmm. at the meeting? And so, so they're just going to be... Or it looks like maybe you've got a response to that. Yeah, there's a policy um, in, yeah. about forums, and so it would be called as a meeting of the Amherst School Committee. There would be you notes know, taken, and you'd be able to participate in that, but it would be, like, you know, formally agended. Uh, the notes are often for forums or not. They're a little different because we're mostly hearing from the public as opposed to having conversations. But um, So as a follow-up to that, so then we would have to kind of set a boundary on what we're going to talk about. We couldn't oh, yeah. hold it as a forum where come meet your school committee members and we'll answer your questions about the Amherst Public Schools. We'd have to be like, we're talking about dual language, we're talking about regionalization, and we're talking about X. And if anybody brought up an issue that was outside of that, we, could, we couldn't really have the back and forth that we'd like to have. I just want to make sure I understand yeah. the, so here's, the boundaries of the, Yeah, okay. here's what I remember yeah. from, and Dr. Morris will correct me if I'm wrong, with the, the form that we did last year, as, mm -hmm. as Mr. Demling mentioned, um, and it was following the school building project uh, vote. Um, the idea was that the uh, you know public comment was open for pretty much anything that, that folks wanted to talk about. We may or may not respond, but we have a, you know, set agenda in the sense that we are asking the community to come and talk about specific topics, mm -hmm. but they can pretty much bring up anything that we want, that, or that they want. So I think in that sense, it, it functions a little bit differently than uh, meetings, although, you know, we do the same thing with our public comments yeah, right. here too, right? So Mr. Nuckin, I think also you? that if, um, if you have an identified oh. section for Q&A on an agenda and the public asks a question and there's a straightforward answer to it, you can absolutely answer the question. And that's not a violation of a meeting mm -hmm. law. The challenge gets to when you're actually starting to discuss or debate. So so it's in the, the challenge is you've got to be like really careful. You've got to really only answer the factual question directly. Because I, if I if I do that, then I editorialize at the end, and then Mr. Demling raises his hand, <laughs> and he starts, you know, and I don't mean there's a negative or an argument. I'm just saying you start opining on my little editorial, yes. then then we're dead. <laughs> so, you know, just in, just in the interest to remind us of those mm -hmm. before we hold any of these, I think it would be good. Um, that's a that's a valid point. Yeah, I think uh, so. In the interest of time, just looking mm. at you know, we still have a few other agenda items to get through. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe it makes sense for the committee for us to come back. Um, you know, I'm happy to work with Dr. Morris or somebody else wants to volunteer and do this too. Um, is just to take a look at you know some possible options mm -hmm. for forum planning. So maybe it's putting together a couple of ideas for the committee to chew on. We can talk about it at our next meeting. Spend a few minutes thinking about what kind of format makes the most sense, um, and then we can go from there. Does that does mm -hmm. that work for mm -hmm. the committee? I'll also send the policy that I was referencing to the Amherst School Committee to all of you so that you can read through what the policy has, because it is actually quite helpful to look through, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're trying to get some more feedback, it feels like, at this point. I think it's giving me a message. <laughs> Okay, so uh, our, the next topic for discussion is a discussion of recent election day procedures. And I, I think this is a fairly short item, but it's a letter that's in your packet. Um, and Dr. Morris, I'll let you bring this up. Sure. So this is a letter that, um, in my conversation with the chair, you know, 
we wanted to, we decided it'd be good to bring up here. People can either decide to vote and support the letter or not. That's certainly the committee's discretion. It'll be sent regardless. Um, and I'll have the signatures of um, myself and the three elementary principals on it. And um, without belaboring the point because of the hour, there were multiple problems that emerged in the September 4th um, election at our site, and they weren't the typical patterns, the problems that we've had before that we felt like were manageable and we work with the town, particularly at Crocker Farm, to manage. They really were that candidates were using their constitutional right to be within the right amount of distance from the voting precincts. More historically, we've never had that. Everyone has sort of respected that we don't want people we don't have quarry checks on in front of the schools. And that's no critique. It's just been the past practice that people would often be, you may have seen them at the entrance of the school buildings. Uh, so we had multiple situations with candidates or candidates' proxies more often, actually, being directly on the school, in front of the school buildings. Um, to be very candid, we had some challenging conversations about, yes, 150 feet or whatever it is, but you know, that's not an okay 150 feet because of proximity to students. Uh, the only thing I could say about the saving grace of the heat at the beginning of the school year is we didn't have outdoor recess. If we had outdoor recess, we would have had to put multiple other systems in place. We had multiple conversations with the town clerk that day. who was incredibly responsive to me in principle, so I want to compliment her. But uh, in my opinion and the principles, the time has come where we just say we, we're not going to have this at our elementary schools. If, if candidates are going to be on site, from our opinion, it's a safety risk that is, doesn't outweigh looking at other options. Uh, other communities, and I've talked to the town clerk about this, um, and she, she knows about it, she, come from, she came from the town clerk elsewhere, have other voting precincts and other ways to do this, and I'm certainly not an expert on a solution, except I don't want the status quo to continue. Uh, I also think it's worth noting this is not a concern for November 6th, which is the next major election, because students are not present. Uh, it's a professional development day, and we put that in place around this very topic, but um, town manager, and town manager knows this is coming, like there's no, um, like, it, totally transparent. They know it's on the, you know, Mr. Bachman knows this is on the agenda tonight, but um, the principals and I felt very strongly about the, this has now become a safety risk for students, and we think the town needs to figure out another solution. Um I move to endorse the letter from Superintendent Morris to uh, our town manager and town clerk. Second. Any further discussion? Sure. Uh, I was I was at uh, Fort River on a couple of occasions, and I was be blunt startled to see that there were um, candidates in campaigns over by the gymnasium entrance, uh, where I'd never seen people standing before. And I guess I guess previously the voting entrance is on the other side of the building. Uh, it was it was on the music room, which was on the yeah, other yeah, side, yeah the other side of the building. Um, but even then, you didn't see people standing out in front of the music room or whatever, or whatever 150 feet from that would be. And so I thought it was, to use the colloquial expression, messed up. And it's interesting to me because I saw it as also being a function. The reason why it's a worthy letter to send, I'll come back to the motion that was made, is, is that it was a combination of uh, do blunt a bunch of the write-in candidates and stuff that were really trying to get the message out about what the procedure for voting, and then also a bunch of town council people right. running. And what that just points to is that in the future, um, we may have just a lot of candidates running for a lot of stuff in places and people who are very enthusiastic and it's all well-intended on their part, um, and hopefully it'll always be well-intended on their part, yeah. but... Um, it's messed up. Yeah. I just have a simple question, and it, um, I, I support the, the, the letter, so um, don't take my question in the wrong way. <laughs> but you mentioned that the ne upcoming election, there's no school, so kids aren't, the students aren't going to be there. Is that an option as an alternative to not having the polling places at the schools? So um, it's an option if we had one election each school year. But the way our primary system works is we're guaranteed to have, I and mean, this, this was unusual because of the Jewish holidays and the election calendar gets shifted, but we typically will have primaries and then right. full elections, mm -hmm. and we don't have enough PD days to go around. Yeah. Um, I also don't love, no, I'm going to leave it there. Yep. But yeah, that, okay. that, that's yep. my answer. Any other questions or comments? Are we ready for a vote? 
All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you very much, Thank and I'll you. keep you keep the committee abreast of any developments that stem from this. So, uh, Dr. Morris, my name's on here as a chair for the the committee. Uh, do we need to put the committee sort of listed on there, or is my name enough as so the chair? What I was thinking, I'd ask Miss Miss Morland to do is um, just add one sentence with the committee's approval that says that this letter was supported by a unanimous vote of the Amherst School Committee, and then I think your signature will be sufficient to. Respond, but I think that one sentence. Heads are nodding do it. for yes. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, great. Yeah, Thank so you. she'll get in touch with you just the signature and we'll okay. get it off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is uh, a big one. Um, this is related to charter school, one of our local charter schools. It has multiple times now requested uh, expansion um, from the state. And I think, Mr. Demling, you have uh, been leading this conversation for the committee, so I'm going to turn it over to you because uh, I understand you prepared some materials for us. Yeah, for so, discussion. I, yeah, thank you. So I, I could have gone one way, which is uh, a presentation as long as the uh, proposal to expand, um, but I decided to offer a couple of slides at this point. Um, so uh, if, so you, you have the electronic version of the proposal. Uh, it's, it's very long, and so I tried to distill um, two things. One, wh what's the financial impact to our district? And then two, wh what's going on with this whole equity piece that is um, promoted as, as the reason for the expansion? So um, I, w I, wanted, I wanted that as like kind of a shared basis of information um, so we can talk about you know, what we do going forward. Um, so just so the first slide, uh, the financial impact to Amherst. So the expansion as proposed, immediately doubles the number of kindergarten classes from two to four. This is like specifically laid out in the proposal. So at, at their class sizes, which have been consistent the last um, few years, that's an additional 44 seats that gets out, added on every year, right? So in uh, less than a year from now, they would have expand from two to four kindergarten classes. Then the next um, <coughs> kindergarten class coming in the year after that expands from two to four. So they're, they're adding an additional 44 seats every year until they get um, for seven years. Um, so what's the impact to our district? Well, so right now, 23% of the school's K-6 to enrollment comes from Amherst. So if you, if you just presume for the moment uh, that they draw at the same rate, that takes an additional 10 students from Amherst every year. Um, and if you look at the rates of charter tuition that we're spending, it creates an immediate charter tuition increase, so starting next fall, of another 203, 710, 203,000. Uh, and then an additional similarly sized increase every year until we eventually hit the state m maximum, which is 9% of our s school spending. So right now we're at, well, last year it was 1.4, 1.5 million approximately charter tuition. Um, we have another 600-ish to go before we hit the, the 2.1 million 9% um, cap. Um, so, that, so that's, that's the impact. Um, so it really is like a second charter school opening from the perspective of our district. Um, and the way that the process works, you know, if, if you followed it last year, um, the expansion can be proposed every single year until it passes. Once it passes, that's it. So, um, you know, not dissimilar to, you know, 10 years ago, the school committee had one opportunity to oppose the expansion, was unsuccessful. This is our one opportunity to influence the process. So th those are kind of the stakes for, for our district, which, I mean, every year we want to oppose charter expansion, but this is particularly uh, targeted to our budget. So, so the next slide, um, w what's really hard to understand is, um, is the reasoning for this. So on the first page of the proposal, um, I'm just quoting the text from the proposal, is that the, the board is making the change to satisfy unmet demand for seats, expand opportunity for students to attend desegregated integrated public schools. Uh, an increased integration of staffing. PVC has proven to be an engine of integration in Hampshire County. So that's the reasoning for the expansion. So I just compare this to the available data from DESE. So um, there's rhetoric the last couple of years talking about um, our responses and responses from other school districts and, and the public about opposition mythology and, cr and talking about myths. Th this is just the data. It's this straight up data, I've sourced it all, so anybody can reproduce it if they want, and the three bars you're looking at here, it's a little hard to look at it in the black and white, but, but the top bar is the average, um, the percentage uh, in, a, in the service region, so a charter school has 
uh, an identified number of towns that it services, and there's 30 odd towns per PVC. So the average percentage of high need students is so for using the top example is 59.2. And high needs is a technical term. It means uh, special ed or uh, economically disadvantaged or ELL or ELL within the previous two years. So it sort of rolls those up. Um, the second bar is the comparison index. So the Department of Ed derives this comparison index, which they say is a more statistically relevant um, bar that where a charter school should be. You'll notice that in every case, it's uh, quite a bit lower than the average of the region. Um, so it's, it's a fairly conservative bar. Um, and then the third is, is, is the school. And so you see with the high needs population, the low income, Hispanic, special ed, ELL, um, they're, they're below, and, and in some cases, far, far below. Um, so, you know, the, the juxtaposition of this data and, and, and this claim for expansion, it, it would be comical if, if, the, if the consequences weren't so serious. Um, so, you know, we, we hope that the new commissioner uh, will, will listen to reason. So the process is that, you know, um, the public and committees and boards have the opportunity, at least until November 1st, we haven't heard if the deadline is later, it may be, but at least until November 1st, we provide input to the commissioner and the commissioner will make a ruling. If, if he does not approve the expansion, the school will almost certainly appeal to the board and then there's another appeal there. So, you know, hopefully the, the idea that the lottery is no excuse for these kinds of disparities, that, that the schools have an obligation to, for recruitment and retention of all these subgroups um, will, will resonate with the commissioner um, as, as hopefully the DESE's past statements um, rejecting the expansions, uh, saying why. Um, talking about that they're not servicing the, the population. Um, but it's, 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 to me, just shocking the, the, the audacity of, of this statement to, to have that be the data, to have been told repeatedly by the department what you need you to do to correct, and then to attack public schools in this way. It's, it's, it's appalling. <laughs> and so, so, yes, we should write our reasoned letter. We should, we should make the data case. We should give the commissioner the opportunity to, to see reason. But I feel like, you know, we, we need to do everything we can to, um, to be frank, sound the alarm in our community um, and, and in the other communities about, about, about what this is. Because what they're, what they're saying is wrong. It's, it's wrong what they're claiming. It's, it's, it's wrong to educate some children at the expense of others. And and and, uh, and and it's it's wrong not to call it out. And so I, I hope that we can, you know, prevail on this. But I feel like something has to happen differently than just some letters and, you know, this, the the same level of advocacy in the past years. So. Dr. Morris. Yes, I'll just I'll make three brief, brief comments. Um, my understanding from Desi, while it's not final, is uh, I do believe that November first deadline will probably hold this year. They're trying to expedite that process, and so probably. It's not specific to this charter expansion, but for all charter expansions to be um, heard by the board sooner, uh, at an earlier date in the calendar year than it has been the last couple. So if you extrapolate what I'm extrapolating from that, it's probably that the October 1st or the November 1st deadline will probably hold in terms of feedback. Uh, the second thing, and, and Mr. Dedling said it, but I want to put a finer point on it, one key dis difference between this proposal as prior, as compared to the prior three is those are mostly focused on the high, expanding the secondary population. This is expanding the elementary population for the Amherst Public Schools. The impact is much greater in this proposal if it was followed, if it was supported as opposed to the last few. And the final point, and it's sort of just a different way to say what Mr. Demlin's saying, but it's, it's I think it's worth stating. So there's, um, if you look in the report uh, or the the um, their application, they have to present uh, the demographics and then gap closing targets. In other words, because they're not in all these areas, they're not at the um, the comparison index. Mm -hmm. There's a there's an index that's formed to say, okay, well we don't expect you to get there immediately. What's a reasonable path that you can that, that the schools can change that gap index, and and the gap between their gap index keeps growing. In other words. The steps that one would take logically to get to where Desi is asking them to go is expanding. Where they are and where they theoretically should be on that slope continues to expand year after year after year. So, um, and I can highlight that a little more. I'm going to write about that in my letter, which I'll share with the committee. Uh, but it's in there. It's not m any math that I'm doing. I love the charts that Mr. Dumbling does. It's no critique. But it's literally in their expansion proposal because they're required to do that. 
you can see that the gap of the demographics from what it needs to be from DESE setting those gap closing targets um, is uh, expanding to the point where I, don't, I, I wonder if it's even possible to make up the gaps because they're getting so large. So, um, and that's not, again, that's directly in their expansion proposal. It's not on DESE's website, it's, it's directly there. So do we have a uh, target for when we're going to have a letter before the committee to approve and send off? Well, I mean, I think it's clearly before uh, November 1st, but we've got two meetings in October set, uh, October 9th and October 16th. Yeah, probably the 16th will change, 16th yeah. Will, yeah, um, but most likely two, two meetings. So we've got until then. So we should probably get a draft by the 9th so mm -hmm. that we can review it, revise it, and approve it no later than the following meeting. I think that sounds reasonable to me. Um, I do. I do want to just, you know, add to that and a, a Mr. Demling's point about, you know, maybe another level of advocacy is mm -hmm. needed. I think that what we've been hearing from other school committees in the region is that they are equally as concerned, um, and that could potentially turn into, you know, um, a higher level of advocacy, both, you know, some sort of joint effort or, who knows, right? We, you know, no idea. Um, but I think that there's an opportunity to help educate the community and help educate the public, and, and um, you know, and if, if the community is interested in participating in this, and I hope they are, because they should be able to see sort of the natural, you know, uh, sequence of events that leads to, you know, the hurting our schools if this expansion goes through, um, that hopefully the public will, will also get involved and, and want to take some action, you know, but I think... Um, what I'm hopeful for is that we see some, you know, parents and families and mm -hmm. community members of public school students uh, not to attack families that have chosen to go to the charter school, but instead to help send the strong message to the commissioner that this expansion is, is hugely problematic for our community uh, and ends up taking away from, from our schools, you know, so... I'm not sure what that translates into at this level for the committee. I think individually we probably all have our own thoughts and ideas on how we might be able to, you know, help uh, share information and share resources and all that. But to the degree possible that we can, at this committee level, I think, yes, writing a letter, uh, you know, having these this on the agenda at our at our meetings and talking with, uh, with members of the public about, you know, what this means is helpful. So, no, I was asking just because I think to me, the, I mean, one, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know what the commissioner will do, and that, that's a big open question because it's a new commissioner. I'm going to assume the board is not going to end up being happy with PVCSES, only because they seem to be increasingly irritated year over year that the, that the school doesn't seem to be listening to them. And so, um, you know, there, to me, there's two different levels of advocacy. One is communicating from our committee or the superintendent, and by definition, that ends up being a more button-down kind of communication than one might otherwise want to do just because it's what's mm -hmm. appropriate and also most likely to convince them to agree with us. And I think things like this slide and what superintendent talked about makes sense. I just wanted to know what the calendar for that was so we don't lose the forest for the trees because <laughs> we actually do need to write a letter, mm -hmm. review it, approve it, and submit it. And that's sort of one thing. I think beyond that, I, I think the idea, I mean, I, I, I think, and you know, I think we've heard this from town meeting when we went before town meeting with a resolution or whatever it was, that um, I, think, I think this should be a teachable moment. I think there was, so we can have a letter opposing this. I think we should be using this as a teachable moment to the broader issues of what's wrong with how we're organizing, organizing and funding charter schools. Because mm -hmm. there's sort of two related but discrete issues. One is the resegregation of our schools and the pernicious way in which the, the way charter schools are organized are, are leaving out and, and balkanizing our populations in ways that are really unfair to the kids and the families, but also unfair to the traditional public school districts. The other issue is it's, um, it's, it's, it's putting enormous pressure on our towns, our town budgets. I mean, just enormous pressure that pops up everywhere. You know, if you think about a lot of the pressure we have in our traditional municipal budget, some of it's because of, of these pressures we're having here. And then even we get, I know this is an elementary, not a regional meeting, but 
the Leverett Elementary School continues to be a source of like major attack and conflict within Leverett, and that spills over to the regional assessment, regional budgets. Mo most of that issue, yes, they're underlying philosophical issues educationally. I guarantee you, if we had another two or three million bucks kicking around, that money would grease a lot of the disagreements so that they weren't popping up in the way that they are now. And so this is, this it, 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 the reality is we need to use, I think we should be using this to teach a moment to really attack the entire way in which mm -hmm. this, is go this is affecting our local budgets, property taxpayers, and schools. And we should be organizing with um, select boards and finance committees in the entire, what is it called? The full, full service, service region, region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the entire full service region, and we should be calling on people to write letters, but also we should have the support of all the political leaders, all the lo local committees and boards, all collectively sending a message um, that enough's enough. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I just, um, just one one th um, thought to add in in that campaign, and I don't know if it's appropriate in a letter to Desi because I don't know sort of how they make what facts and, and criteria they look to, at to make their decision on this, um, following what they've asked them to do is probably a big one. But the, um, for me, what really stuck out was the $200,000. Um, and I think, you know, when in a teachable moment when we're talking about the broader community, spelling that out and putting that into context as, as to what proportion, what's the opportunity cost of that 200000 right? What, what what can we not do if we don't have that in our budget? Because I, I think everybody recognizes it's a, it's a large sum of money, but it's also at the point where, like, it's really hard to grasp what that means and what that looks like. Oh, it's 200 you know, there's X million dollars in the budget, you know, we'll probably, mm -hmm. you know, miss some after-school project or something. But I think it's putting that into that context and from a percentage, but also the opportunity cost, I think can really help us, particularly when we're looking at all of these big budget items, um, you know, infrastructure, things that we all have big price tags, right? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that really impacts us. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, no, no, please, yeah. yeah. Ms. Fitzroy, I, yeah. I guess my only, my only comment was, I feel like one of our allies and would be other local elected officials. And given that right now we're in this weird <laughs> hybrid where um, we have multiple seats where we have people who we know will, I guess for now we have Solomon, but I mean, we've got so many people who are running for town council. So um, I don't think town, I'm just trying to think of how we can get these voices um, to align with ours. And mm -hmm. potentially it's a little bit more challenging because some of them are not yet seated in their positions or they're lame ducks or they're actively running. But if there's a way that all of us as we're out in Amherst can try to get at least the conversation that's happening in during these all because there's so much political activity right now that if there's a way we can insert this conversation mm -hmm. into it and getting people to come out publicly either you know obviously for um, op opposing this I think we should all be asking our town council candidates how do you feel about this mm -hmm. and then if we can trying to um, push those who are about to be seated in, in their new positions. Um, but I mean, the election's not even going to happen by the time we need to do this. So uh, it's, it's just too bad that we don't have yeah. that um, clear pathway. But if we can, I think we should try to get it to be part of any forums that are going on um, or any conversations. They can still write letters. Yeah, no, we should, but we should be asking them yes. to. And, and then like, take a public yep. stance yep. and do yep. that. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Morris? So just on the first point, or one of the points, um, I think the, the dollar amount matters a lot to the community. My personal experience is that is not a, a salient point to DESE as mm -hmm. it is to us. So like for instance, the fact that charter reimbursement's wildly underfunded, that's not, DESE, you know, they, they agree that that's a problem. Even the most ardent charter supporter of DESE agrees that that's a problem. But it's not a problem they can solve. It's a legislature mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. or, you know, th that's who. So um, I think the tricky balance in some of this is it's okay to mention that, but I, that's true for every community where any charter school is trying to be either settled or expanded. Like if you follow West Springfield over the last year, that's been a complicated situation uh, for a whole host of reasons, actually. Um, so I, I, I think it's okay to mention, but I wouldn't have that be the lead because um, mm -hmm. I don't think... 
There's people who have a very different educational philosophy from those of us, I think, in the room who are, see choice as a panacea to, right, and they could, right, and, and so, and a lot of those people are the people who are going to be reading this. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I hope you asked it as a question, as an yep. open question, I wanted yep. to answer from just from my experience. On the other piece, I do think there's other elected officials, both in Amherst and neighboring communities. I know that in the past there were multiple communities, including some of the members of the regional towns and, and otherwise. So I do think there, if there's an opportunity if the committee wants, that's a logical way to get uh, more mm -hmm. communities involved. Um, I know Desi reads the num and looks at the number of communities who have weighed in pro or con. I've been at meetings where they say, well, we didn't hear, we didn't get any letters from any superintendents or school committees on this expansion or this new charter, and that matters for them. So. I don't want to minimize the impact of a letter that the Amherst School Committee might have, but I also don't want to mm -hmm. uh, minimize the impact that um, other school communities might just need to be reminded they might not be having this conversation tonight, and that they might feel equally as passionately, but they just perhaps need to be connected to the cause. Mr. Nakajima? Well, I think we should actively organize. Yeah. I mean, I think we should, you know, we have, there's got to be a Shedling probably has a list of all the towns that are in the what is it called again? Full <laughs> service region. <laughs> Trying to use the term of art. Um, let's list them and let's go out and let's let's affirmatively engage yeah. the different political actors and bodies of those places and let's get them to see if they're willing to sign on. I think I think there should be two different messages. One me this is why I asked about the letter to begin with. I already knew that the letter that goes to Desi or Bessie. Um, needs to be no the board yeah, or yeah. the or the That's department. Right. Yeah. So I, I meant what I said as dumb as it sounded. That's just um, yeah. <laughs> the, um, that the letter that goes to them needs to be drained of the fiscal stuff and only focus on like the the service issues and you know and and the and what you said the gap to closing the ga the gap the increasing gap to closing the gap and all that kind of stuff and there's lots we can throw in there that'll be really good. I actually, as a matter of the public discussion, I completely disagree with you. I think the public discussion to get, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to argue with you. Whether you meant to or not, yeah. what I'm simply saying is the public strategy to engage the select boards, finance committees, other school committees, and then parents, the public at large, should absolutely go after the fiscal issue as well as the resegregation, pedagogical, educational program issues. I mean, we should absolutely go after both of them. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say, perhaps not as articulate as I'd like. Yeah. So Mr. Dunley, and then I think we need to yeah, wrap yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, so just a couple of minor points. Um, so how, what the board's disposition in is, re is really an open question. Like, they have expressed frustration mm -hmm. in the past. They've also expressed uh, ideological support. And that board is shifting over time. The more Baker appointees go on. Mm -hmm. There's a whole tangent on Republican conservative privatization that I will not go into right now. <laughs> but, um, mm -hmm. but that's shifting, right? And so um, we, we, we can't... Uh, we can't bank on the fact that they're just going to be like, mm -hmm. oh, here they are again. Um, thus the reason for additional, creating additional external visible political pressure. And not just, oh, there's the number of letters, but like, oh, look, this got it in the news. The, here's these new state reps that are, are pounding the pavement and saying like this, you know, that the, being, being loud and heard. Um, and in terms of engaging like the local candidates and, and how we do that, um, I actually think most of the political attention in town right now is focused on those town council candidates. So let's make this an issue, and not like an issue in terms of like what do you support, but bring it up, right? And let's let's have saying and because it affects the municipal side of things as well. Even if you don't care about the second slide, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars that are leaving that the town would have to fill fill the gap and not be filling it on other things. Um, and you know, for a lot of the town candidates, they're green and they don't understand all the mechanisms yet of of town finances and how it relates to schools. So it's an educational opportunity for them as well. And mm -hmm. so while the public is paying paying attention to these campaigns, let's let's make that as, as much as possible um, part of that. So just to uh, wrap up this conversation, I think that you know what we formally can do here in the committee is, as Mr. Nakajima mentioned before and as we've done previously, is to prepare a letter, um, have that letter you know signed by whomever here in the committee wants to do that. So we, we're working on a draft. Um, Mr. Dimling, I'm looking to you to sure. help us put together something that has all the data and everything that we need in there. Um, and then I think we can, you know, share uh, individually with with committee members, you know, if there's other opportunities for, um, you know, engaging the public or doing other things like that, that we can we can do that. So does that um, does that work for? Okay. Mr. Let's list the towns and let's go after other towns and make sure we're communicating with them mm -hmm. to see if they're engaging our letters. Yep. That too. Okay, sounds great. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so moving on, we uh, are on to gifts. And we have some gifts, it looks like. Some very neat ones. Yes, these are great gifts. I will take a motion if anybody wants to. Mr. Nakajima. I move that the uh, Amherst School Committee accept the following gifts as specified. Uh, Sanjay Arwadi and Mary Clark, supplement art budget for Fort River, Singer, $500. Stacy Leonard, Stephen Sixanian, uh, Family Center Summer Student Assistance, $500. Amherst Educational Foundation Year-Round Garden Project, Wildwood, Fort River, and Crocker Farm, $2,500. Sanjay Arwadi, Fort River PGO Fundraiser. PGO purchased 30 sets of cross-country skis and storage units at a cost of $2,523. And Southern Poverty Law Teaching Tolerance Educator Grant for Elementary in the amount of $5,000 for a total number of gifts, amount of gifts of $11,023. Take a second. Second. Gently. Any comments? All those in favor to accept the gifts? Thank you very much. It's unanimous. And thank you to everyone who uh, has made some generous donations. We really appreciate it. Uh, okay, so school committee planning. So, Norris? Yeah. Um, so. If you look at, um, try to fill in this calendar document, which hopefully everyone has in front of them. I'll give people a second. So for the next meeting on the 9th, uh, we had, kind of, as mentioned earlier, the academic program for dual language. Seems like we need to come back, so we had communication for the forums. Parker Farm Space Needs mm -hmm. is a topic we said we'd come back to. Um, PVCICS letter is not written on there, but I added it um, in handwriting. Dual language zoning. Um, I'm starting to feel like this meeting is getting overwhelming in terms of agenda topics, so we'll think about that. Um, the goals I'll have a draft of. Um, last year, town meeting approved additional funds, 15000 um, mm -hmm. And we said we'd come back to talking about that, that it was too preliminary to have that conversation, so we feel like we have enough information to have that conversation special education program so that group wants to get together um, and the UMass study can't happen on the 9th so that should be crossed off okay. which then leads to perhaps we're still waiting to hear back from the town but the chair and I have talked about that instead of the 16th perhaps the 22nd would be a uh, meeting where we would be able to receive the UMass report perhaps in a joint way with the select board um, and we put some other topics uh, on there but I um, just want to highlight that they're the 16th is not possible to receive the UMS report, and we don't want to wait too long to receive that until November, um, perhaps. So we may be moving the meeting of the, of the 16th to the 22nd, yeah. or sometime. In a Still waiting to hear back Still from the, back. the town about whether that would work. Um, but um, so we assume we want to add in some update on maintenance and mm -hmm. custodial. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do people feel about not doing the zoning on the 9th, just given the quantity and quality of other topics and pushing that to be a larger topic on the 22nd or whenever that meeting is? I'm just concerned that we'll get to that at 10 o'clock. Well, I, I have been wondering if, could we move the Crocker Farm space discussion to the, the later meeting? Or is that I think that's that actually going to be a very brief agenda item. Really? Yeah. That's a little forecasting, but um, or foreshadowing, but it'll be a very brief agenda item. I mean, we have we have to do this vote though, right, on, on dual language, and I feel like the zoning piece is going to be a big part of that. Sure. Um, so the reason this was on here is because of the implications for the dual language piece. Because if we talked about, well, if Crocker Farm runs out of space, then how do we? Mm -hmm. Where do the kids go? Mm -hmm. So that's why we put on. I'm okay putting it. I'm totally fine moving it down. Um, my concern about the space at Crocker Farm after meeting with Mr. Shane Walk in the building is it's not as high as it was a, a couple of weeks ago, so I'm fine moving it down. Sorry, just a, qu a question of clarification. So the the dual language vote is going to be on both the question of do we do this as well as how are we zoning it? 
So my understanding was that we decided to separate those two things um, so that we'd vote on kind of the programming. Do we feel like the program is in place and those pieces and the resources needed and come back to the zoning for a vote perhaps in the late fall, early winter? I thought that was the discussion, and I could be remembering it wrong, but... I don't remember us separating it out completely because it, it, the two are connected, right? right. I, mean, we, I think it was more about figuring out how we do it, like okay. the, the technical piece of it, but not having it be too separate. I mean, it's a question for the committee, right? Like, you know, if we're going to be voting on dual language programming, um, how separate do we want to have a conversation or not have a conversation around zoning in relation to that? Mr. Nugget. Oh, I, I do feel like that separate, but maybe, you know, maybe not too broadly temporarily, right? So, but I, I do feel like they're, they're definitely related conversations, but it's sort of cart before the horse if we're talking about zoning at the same time and we haven't really locked up and, and decided, are we doing this and are we moving forward? So mm -hmm. it does feel, it, it, and, you know, I don't want to assume, but, you know, all signs point to that we're, we're you know, lean more towards yes versus not, but I, I do feel like it's a, it, it could be premature to be finalizing a zoning decision before we've actually finalized all of the other pieces, mm -hmm. but does that happen on two separate meetings or in the same meeting separate votes? I, that's a question. I don't know. I guess, my, I guess my view would be, I wonder whether these things have to be entirely binary. Um, there may be a framework for how we're going to engage zoning that we would need to consider and vote concurrent to approving the program moving forward. That might not mean every little detail is worked out of the zoning mm -hmm. proposal. But but to me, um, I've kind of said this before, so I'm not saying anything really new. Um, I think everyone wants to do this. So the key of whether we do this or not boils down to whether we can figure out how feasible and pragmatic it is to implement, right? And so then, to me, putting off the discussion of zoning, at least at, least at a framework level of these are the right. basic way or, pro, or concept of how we're going to implement it, seems to me to be foolhardy because mm -hmm. since most of our concerns are pragmatic, if we can't figure out a way to do the zoning or you know, the enrollment within that program that makes sense to everyone and gets broad support from the community, then we shouldn't be doing it. That's, that's, that's what I understood as well. Yeah. 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 No, that's so fine with me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it a bunch this summer. Um, mm -hmm. I'll be honest to say, at this point, maybe it's some light in being too candid. Not yeah. much has changed in our thinking um, from where we were, but I think we need to re-engage that at a larger level. Yeah. You know? But think about what I mean. I'm sorry to throw this out, yeah. but just think about what I just said a moment ago, right. that if there's a ways of chunking out how specific the plan you're putting forward for us, it's right. what you've talked about with the whole thing, right? right. You've said this whole thing is going to be like this slow rolling movement towards yeah. implementing it, in which some things aren't going to be finalized until like next August, right. Right. but but you're working on it every day, right? right? Yeah. That may be the same thing with zoning through February that's right. or January or whatever, but, and that's okay. Right. So the question is, what do, what do we need to, and I know that, you know, it's unfair because you can say like, but why isn't the committee telling you what you want to know? But I'm saying the point is the dialogue should be, what do we need to know and right. decide by November 5th mm -hmm. right. to make right. this a reasonable and also yeah. responsible like on our part. Yeah. Like, I don't want someone, I hate to say this, I don't want somebody a year from now being like, what on earth were you thinking? Why didn't you, like, ask questions and think this through, right? Yeah. No, that totally makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we've exhausted this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exhausted might be the word. <laughs> this agenda, yes. And we're exhausted. Uh, so... Uh, Dr. Morris, you and I can meet later on and go through some of the, the finer points of the sure. next meeting agendas. Okay. And with that, um, I will take a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. A second. Thank you. All those in favor? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks to Amherst Media.